Yo, what's up, guys? We are live. We got Vosh joining us for a debate. So this is going to be interesting. Uh, you guys have requested this over and over again, and I'm glad we can make it happen. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, let me just announce a few things. So um, I'm not, I'll be honest, Vosh, I'm not super familiar with your content. Uh, like, I watched a good amount of it today. So I think initially I'm going to have to, like, flesh out your positions on certain things. So if I'm asking you questions that you've answered in videos, um, just bear with me. Absolutely. Um, I also think that we're not going to disagree nearly on nearly as much as most people think we will. But I guess we'll kind of get to the bottom of that. And one last thing I'll say, I respect you coming out for debate, dude. Um, a lot of people are afraid to have discussions, afraid to have debates. So if someone's willing to talk to someone who has different ideas than them, then they have my respect. Um, okay, so with that out of the way, I guess let me start off with this question. Um, what do you agree and disagree with the red pill slash pickup community on? Um, I disagree with quite a lot. I think there are some basic underlying tenets that make a lot of sense. Uh, oh. basically the fact that women, people in general, but women gravitate towards uh, confidence that it's important to do stuff like work out, you know, basic self-help advice like that. The issue uh -huh. is that I think there's a whole framework built around that. Um, which involves the, you know, the, the gamification of flirting with women to the point where you're checking off this really big list in your head of like making sure you've, you know, hit on all these steps. And I think that can be really detrimental. I think the most reliable step to be happy and to form good relationships at the end of the day is just treat women like regular ass people and just be cool with them, be confident, and uh, you'll probably be fine. And if they aren't interested in you after all that, then that's, that's fine. You know, maybe they're just not your type. Okay, um, so what what exactly is the claim in the Red Pill community that you would say? So it's more of like, um, what the vibe of like, uh, I guess, thinking of in your interactions with women as like a game? Is that is that the thing? Or Yeah, well, um, that's definitely a big part of it. It depends on where you are in the Red Pill community. The Red Pill subreddit, which I used to look at quite a bit, I mean, it mm -hmm. literally had like people in favor of rape. So... It, you know, it, depending on how where where you go in the spectrum, I'm going to disagree more or less. But generally oh. speaking, I feel like pickup artistry often like misses the point of social interaction, and it it can be really difficult to form good relationships when you're so obsessed with following the archetype of like you know engagement with women. Mm. Yeah, I would say that 99.99 percent of the Red Bull community would not be in favor of rape. Obviously, uh, I think that goes without saying. But okay, so let's get into the um, I guess gamification. Um, I, I see your point, uh, that, you know, it can be like, if you're going off and you have like a weird checklist in your mind, that can be, you know, kind of awkward and cringe. Uh, but what if you're a guy who has like, just, you don't have good social skills for whatever reason, maybe you didn't have a good upbringing, maybe you were bullied, maybe you just, no one ever explained to you. And like, you just don't really understand how to talk to women. Like you just don't know what to do. And like, what, what would be, what would be bad about having like some stuff in the background being like, okay, you know, I should maybe you know, flirt with her. I should move things forward. Like, do you see that as problematic? No, I think it's important to keep some things in mind. It really depends on the type of advice that's being given. If you're uh -huh. socially um, uh, stunted or something like that, I think it can be useful to practice talking to people. Um, I think one of the biggest considerations, especially with talking to women, is uh -huh. that there are some things that women consistently do socially differently from men, and a lot of that has to do with being afraid of men, because men tend to be like predatory in a lot of social and physical interactions. So I feel like the big issue is like the big dichotomy is a lot of people want to open up and to be direct and engaged and to indicate their interest in somebody, but they also understand that they could come across as creepy if they do it in the wrong way. And that's where the whole meme like, uh, you know, if you're ugly, you get called creepy. If you're hot, you get called flirty comes about. And I think that keeping in mind, like, what can I do to make them feel comfortable? What can I do to avoid those pitfalls? That's good. Um, but it, it, it shouldn't go, if it goes too far, then you've gone beyond keeping things in mind and you've gone to like keeping a checklist and that I don't like. Mm. Uh, I mean, I don't know if we're even necessarily disagreeing on that point. I do think like if you have, if you have this very structured, rigid idea of what flirting and a man to woman interaction should be, that's probably gonna be detrimental to your own success because then it's not gonna feel organic. But I wanna expand on what you said about the predatory thing. So are you referring to, like, are you saying that most men are predatory when they interact with women? Or are you talking about like a small exception? No, no, I don't think most men. I think I would say that most men are insufficiently aware of how their behavior can trigger red flags in women with regards to predatory mm -hmm. behavior. Um, but that's not the same as being like deliberately predatory. 
Um, there are enough predatory men that most women, I think, have had an experience with them in some form or another, and that's definitely going to make them cautious. Like, for example, when I'm flirting with women, I don't have to be afraid of anything. Nobody's going to spike my drink. Nobody's going to attack me. There's no implicit or coercive threat that can work against me. You know, short of pulling a gun on me, I'm fine. And nobody, I don't think they're going to pull a gun on me. But that's not the case for everyone. Um, so I think keeping that in mind, that implicit concern, is, um, is really important to make people feel comfortable. Well, I, just to, again, I don't want to get into the weeds, but uh, yes, you're right. There's nothing you really have to worry about if, from a physical threat perspective in America. If you're like in Colombia, for example, the threat of being roofied and robbed is very real. It's happened to like multiple friends of mine. But yeah, in America, that's extremely, extremely uncommon. Uh, I, w I would say that this, like men, and w we have different concerns when it comes to uh, interacting with other genders. So for example, a woman, yes, there's the physical you know, threat risk uh, for sure. For men... I would say, you know, uh, being taken advantage of, like women trying to gold dig, um, women trying to use a guy for what, this and that, and men do that to some extent too. And uh, another one, which again, I don't think is super common, but it does happen, is false rape accusations. So those are like, I think that we have different things we got to watch out for, but I do agree that men, we don't have like a physical safety risk in the US or in first world countries when interacting with women. I mean, would you disagree with any part of that? Yeah, I just, well, false rape accusations seem to be about as frequent as false allegations of any other major crime. So while it's certainly something that can happen, you know, it's not impossible, um, I don't think it should be something that really dominates your thoughts when you're talking with women. In terms of like the gold digging, though, that. stuff like that, that's more of a like, if the friendship doesn't turn out such and such way. I don't think it's really comparable to the uh, the implicit threat of physical violence, you know? Like, if a, if a woman turns out to be a gold digger or whatever, I mean, you know, okay, but you chose to buy the drinks or this or that. Um, I don't think it's quite the same as being attacked. It's just an unfortunate consequence. Uh, you could say the other way, there are tons of guys who pretend to be friends with girls, but it turns out they only want to sleep with them. That's super common. Um, but I, I wouldn't, like if a woman was saying like, well, you know, you need to watch out for this the same way you need to watch out for being like assaulted by them. You know, I'd also think that's kind of an overstatement. Mm. But you would agree that the vast majority of men um, don't have any kind of malicious intent when interacting with women. Like most men are not predators. Most men are not trying to physically assault women. Like you would agree with that, right? Um, yeah, most men. I think the number of men who have malicious intent is very small. I would say that the number of men who beget malicious outcomes or at least negative outcomes uh, unknowingly is, is a lot higher though than a lot of people are comfortable with. High enough that, I mean, a lot of women uh, are familiar with some experience of sexual assault or rape or sexual harassment. And I sure. bet... For a lot of them, the guys that did that didn't think they were doing that thing. In fact, that seems to be more common than examples where guys are fully aware of what they were doing. So it's just something to keep in mind. And women will be on guard often with stuff like that, which seems reasonable. No, I agree. That does seem reasonable. But what do you mean by that? Like, what do you mean? Like, the guy raped the girl and he wasn't aware of it? Like, how does that happen? A lot of people don't really know what consent is. Um, a lot of people, like, they'll fuck someone who's super drunk and they'll think, like, that's okay. Um, or they'll have sex with a person under really implicitly coercive circumstances. Like, uh, you'll have a chick who's at a guy's place because she drank a lot and she just sort of drunkenly agreed to head over, like, in a taxi. And then when she sobers up, like, she's at this dude's place, he's in control of the house, she doesn't have her car there, so she can't leave without an Uber, she can't find her phone or whatever, and the guy's, like, hardcore flirting with her. And maybe the guy's just thinking, damn, this is a hot chick in my house, like, I'm gonna flirt with her. But maybe the girl's thinking, if I don't fuck this dude, he might hurt me. So she has sex with him, and it's like, uh, oh, it's not like malicious rape, but it's definitely, you know, blurring the lines with consent. You know, it's, it's yeah, it's the implication. Yeah. It's like that, that it's, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Maybe. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> the implication, yeah. Um, hmm, okay, but you would, you would classify that in the, in the rape, rapey category? I don't know if there's a hard line to stuff like that. It's, it's, at the very least, it's bad behavior that can be worked on. Um, in, in terms of, like, rape, were to draw that line, well, when does it be turn into rape as opposed to just, like, reading the consent lines really badly? I don't know where that line is exactly. Well, it's definitely something should, that shouldn't happen. I think the line should be, would, should that person go to jail for that? I think that's where we kind of have to, like, is, is this a crime that should be punishable by the law, or is this something that is ethically dubious? I think what I just described wouldn't be punishable by the law. Um, because it would, the woman would not be impaired, uh, chemically at that point, And she would have technically consented, but I think that morally it's still bad. Um, so at that point, I think, I think it's still behavior to be avoided. Hmm. Okay. Do you think that should be punishable by the law or you're okay with it as is? 
No, the problem with like rape cases is that it's always going to be really he said, she said. Um, in terms of moving over the definitions, you know, I don't know if there's ever going to be a legal line that like uh, perfectly punishes all the people who deserve it and doesn't punish the people who don't. Um, where it is right now is, is, is probably fine. I don't know if I would really offer a legal critique, more of a social okay. one. Fair enough. Do you, okay, let, let me kind of change gears a little bit. Do you, um, do, do you have the problem with the idea of like, okay, let, let me rephrase that differently. Do, do you think there's an element of game involved with flirting and courtship, meaning like guys are playing a little bit of a game, girls are playing a little bit of a game? Uh, yeah, I'd say so. Though I, I hate that game though. I generally try to avoid women who do that, but yeah, I, I think it happens to an extent. But do you think some of that is just socially accepted? Like some women, like maybe they don't even want to do it, but they just feel like, oh, you know, if I give in too easy, like, you know, the guy's not going to like me. Uh, I have to like flirt with him and maybe be a little sassy. Oh, yeah, I totally agree with that. I usually mm. try, at least when I'm talking to people who I'm interested in, I usually try to dispel that and be very direct. Um, but uh, the um, in, with regards to the social expectation, like women get slut shamed if they give it up too easy and guys feel like they have to play into that because otherwise they might get accused of getting creepy. So, yeah, that's kind of like an artificial barrier. Mm. But then I don't think you would disagree on that point um, with the pickup community because that's basically the pickup community would be like, yeah, you know, uh, you know, there's this game and we just basically want to help you play it better. I mean, that's the basic premise. It's not to like create a game when game doesn't exist, right? Like, oh, let's make everything a game. Let's make human interaction a game. I think it's just like, okay, let's acknowledge that there's this social game and just basically help you play it better. So you're not, because if you if you don't know how to play the game at all, and like a chick, for example, is like playfully flirting with you and she's like, oh, stop. And then you just take that, you can't pick up on that. And you're just like, what did I do, right? That's, she's just gonna be turned off. It's like this guy has like no social intuition. That's like a pretty, you know, just one example. Though, for what it's worth, I think that any woman who would react that way is probably not worth your time anyway. Um, but yeah, it's mostly about how you play that game, I suppose. Because, especially when it comes to dating and sex, a lot of people are really, really easy to manipulate. Not just women, like everyone. A lot of people are horny and desperate, right? So, I there are definitely ways to increase the likelihood of you sleeping with someone, but I think sure. a lot of them involve... Um, kind of playing off insecurities in a way which are, it's not rape or anything. Um, but I do, I do feel like it's not conducive to building a healthy relationship with that person. Okay. So I think we might've stumbled upon a potential disagreement. So can you give me an example of, um, like how that would be like, uh, like how you could, uh, play off a person's insecurity to get them in bed? Uh, negging. That's the big one, right? That's the whole, the practice of, uh, playfully insulting a person mm. in order to make them uh, self-critical or self-conscious so that they're more receptive to compliments and more willing to believe that your interest in them is worthwhile. Yeah, that, 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 that is a good example. Um, it's not really common in the pickup community nowadays. Like, I think the vast majority of PUA channels will, like, kind of mock the idea of negging. Um, it's something that what came about from uh, Neil Strauss's book, The Game. And I think that book made it seem like it's something that's much more prevalent than it is. Like, for example, me personally, I never like teach negging. I just say, you know, tease the girl and flirt with her, but don't like actually try to like bring down her value because that's just going to call off courage. Um, can you name another example of something like that? Yeah, negging is one of them. Um, I feel like perceived disinterest is a big one as well. Uh, a really big part, at least from the dating advice that I've seen in a lot of communities, is to constantly give the impression that you're not really invested that much yeah. in the person or the conversation, because overinvestment can come across as creepy or overinvolved, and you want her to feel like she has to chase you a little bit as well. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but does that really play on her insecurities if you just, like, don't act like you're super interested? Um, not always. It can sometimes. Uh, there are a lot of people with abandonment issues, for example, who I know are really, really... I don't want to use the word triggered. I don't know if that's right. They're, they're very receptive, I guess, to the oh. perceived threat of, um, of people dipping on them, you know? Uh, I feel like, in terms of, like, efficaciousness, you know, like, how much this all works, I, I agree, there are lots of things you can do to kind of work with a person's um, psyche to, to make it more likely that you'll get together, but I feel like it, 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 even if it, maybe you get, like, laid because of it, I feel like it's generally better to be really, like, just sort of autistically upfront and direct um, with a lot of people, because even if that will put some of them off, uh, I think that it leads to better outcomes with the people it does work on. Mm -hmm. um, and that's and that's nice. And it's more authentic in that case, because you don't feel like you have to keep this whole thing juggled to, to, to engage with them. 
Mm. So yeah, so what you're describing is called radical honesty. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of proponents of it. I don't, I'm not necessarily critical of it. Like I'm pretty, I would say that um, I'm quite honest and upfront, but I wouldn't say I go down that far to the point where I'm radical honesty. So I guess let's get into like some examples. Like for example, if let's say you were on a date with a girl and you were feeling horny and you just want to fuck the shit out of her, like, would you actually say that to her or? Uh, yeah, as long, well, not like as an opener. Uh, you know, it's not the first thing that come out of my mouth, but yeah, as a, as a, as a general thing, you know, if you're, if you're at a party or whatever and you're like, uh, yeah, you know, I'm enjoying talking to you and, you know, I think you're hot. I don't know if you feel the same way, but if you are interested, you can do X or Y, you know, something like that. Obviously it's highly contextual, but I think it's okay to be direct like that. Well, what if, like, for example, like, you're on a date and the chick is talking and, like, what she's talking about is just boring the shit out of you and, like, in your mind you're just thinking, like, pretty much every guy has had this. You're like, you know what? I just want to fuck this girl and I just don't want to talk to her because her personality is such a turnoff, but she's so hot. Like, would you actually express that to her? I wouldn't want to fuck somebody I found that boring. Um, but if I, if I wanted to, if, if that was the goal... I, I think you could pull the conversation away from that if you wanted to. Um, yeah, you know, something like, you know, I'm enjoying the conversation with this or that, but, uh, you know, there's uh, something that I can't get off my mind and blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, I can't, can't ad-lib the entire process uh, right off the cuff, but I, I think it's okay to do something like that. I would never, I would never say, like, if, if, if you're talking to somebody on a date or whatever, they're boring you. Like, you, anything to stop that. I think works just fine, you know. I have no patience for boring conversations. I don't think anyone should have to put up with that for pussy. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, because it's tedious, uh -huh. and I think it makes you think less of 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 the whole process in general. Like, well, this is what uh -huh. I have to put up with to get laid. I have to deal with women, you know, something like that. I mean, it sounds like basically you're saying you you would express yourself in a socially calibrated way. That's kind of like the feeling I'm getting, which I think is fine. I think that there's advantages and disadvantages to that strategy. I think that the advantage is that the girls that you hit it off with, like you're going to hit it off with more, like meaning like you're, by being polarizing, you're screening out a lot of people, but the people you do match with, it's going to be like, because you guys are exactly in line. Um, the downside to the strategy is that you're screening out a lot of girls in the middle. So meaning girls who, you know, you might really vibe with once you got to know them better, but initially they just get turned off by you being a little too honest in that moment right because you know we people don't generally speak and don't even open up like that much right away like it takes time for most people to open up and feel out their personality right so you could potentially screen away someone who might be a good fit for you um you know because you didn't really want to play the game does that make sense no it totally makes sense I, I i understand you're leaving people on the table so to speak when you do things that way i'm only talking about my personal preferences oh, okay. Okay. with regards to how people handle these situations in general i do feel like the gamification of flirting can lead to some negative outcomes i think everyone's going to have different strategies for flirting which is fine i would only ask that people not do anything like deliberately try to manipulate people's sense of self-worth as long as everyone's doing it above board you know playing the game in a light-hearted you know not overly right. involved way i think that's okay uh you know any kind oh. of social interaction is um to an extent uh you know reciprocal and, and not adversarial um dialectic where you both play off each other and oh. uh, there's nothing wrong with learning to do that better okay so you, you don't actually have a problem with like the aspect of the game you just don't want like dark triad type of tactics that's what you don't like basically yeah right? yeah yeah exactly i'm not principally opposed to uh to 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 the concept of dating advice though i will say the majority of people on youtube or whatever who i've seen talk about dating advice not you i haven't seen like through your content something that made me upset but uh oftentimes i see stuff that basically boils down to like very traditional attitudes like almost um evo psych attitudes towards men and women like women biologically want this and men biologically want that in order to get what you need from them you need to trick them into like that kind of thing and that i that i dislike Mm. do any names like stick out to you like is there any videos you could reference where you kind of like saw that or like they were talking about tricking chicks and whatnot ah, uh the um there's a there's a youtube like this just happened like a week ago there's a youtube mm -hmm. channel called think before you sleep uh oh headed, i saw your reaction video to that yeah headed by a person i'm not a tremendous fan of politically um but he was going over dating coaches who he was critiquing because oh. and those dating coaches he were critiquing i think they were actually quite bad um but his criticisms in them were also kind of bad. So, you know, it's, you know, everyone loses, really. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so, stuff like that. I don't, I don't know how much the scene has really evolved. I just, I remember the Red Pill subreddit, like, seven years ago, and that place was really bad. Um, I mostly just want, I want, I just want dudes to be happy, really. 
Um, I just yeah. know that sometimes they get so caught up in um, the idea that one neat trick will save their social life yeah. that they just kind of bounce between it like fad diets and nothing really works. No, I actually I agree with you on that. I, that makes sense. I do think that there's some really dumb shit in the pickup and record community that I've actually personally been really critical of myself. So, um, but yeah, I do agree with you on that. I think dudes do tend to like look for they think that there's like a one liner um, that they could use and that will get them the girls. I think the marketing aspect of the pickup industry definitely doesn't help uh, because like, you know, if you want to have a very persuasive sales page, you can say, hey, buy my product and go out there and talk to girls and you might get you know better results and blah, blah, blah. Or you can say, we're going to teach you this one magic line. You're going to get 99% of checks you talk to. Right. So that kind of creates that impression. I Stuff think, like that. Yeah. I think that problem exists in a lot of industries like fitness industry, for example. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's just specific to the pickup industry, but okay. I think no, I agree. It, I think it's specific to any industry that teaches you how to be the gender that you identify as anything like a diet advice, you know, look like this workout, you know, get a manly body like this dating. So you can act like a proper guy in, in social situations, anything that plays on people's insecurity, that they're not a right woman or right man. I think people get super vulnerable to, to really bad advertising in those fields specifically. Mm, but don't but don't you think it happens with like industries when it comes to like financial advice and making money like oh take our sales course and you're gonna 100 extra business when it's like largely nonsense like yeah. i see it a lot in that industry too to an extent yeah i think so i think um there might be a different niche group there that gets affected um i think it's caused by a sense of like anxiety middle class people i think often go for that sort of thing and lower class people tend to go for like lottery or like gambling schemes to uh, make wealth quickly. I think the, the position you're in in life really determines what kind of shit you fall for. And oh. I feel like men and women who are kind of like not fully secure with their role gravitate towards those things. But I would agree. It's the same basic logic when you have like these get rich quick schemes where you're just trying to play off somebody's like immediate desperate feeling that they're not living life the right way. Yeah, I think we're in agreement on that. Okay, let's let, let me um, then move on to other things. What are some other things that you would disagree with the red pill or pickup community on? Oh god. Well, I think the um the Evo psych is is a big part of it. I feel like there's what, what a really is that? Can... I've never heard that term before. Oh, uh, ev evolutionary psychology. It's uh, like okay. in this context, like the idea the idea that there are like these really big strong fundamental differences between men and women. Um and I think like obviously there are some, so, you know. You can you you can see at least a few. Um but in terms of like how to date or like pick people up or whatever, I think in terms of how people form friendships, it's like basically the same. Uh, socially, we're instructed to treat flirting differently. Uh, that's a big one. But in terms of like the fundamentals, like biologically, what do we respond to? I think people just just like friendly dudes, you know? I just think people want to have a good friendship and people, you know, people like fucking and it's pretty simple all around. Okay. Uh, well, can, can you like pinpoint some specific ones that you've heard uh, like in, uh, I guess I'll say Evo Psych, my first time using that term. Um, community, like some specific differences that you think aren't actually true, that you think are BS? Um, well, I would say that uh, the idea that women fundamentally need a man to protect them or that they have a biological drive to seek out something like that, um, I think that gets <laughs> heavily overstated. There's a social pressure there, I admit, but I think the biological element there gets massively overstated. Um, mm -hmm. I think you've, you've stuff like that. It's uh, another is... Um, uh, the gatekeepers of sex. Socially, women are definitely the gatekeepers of sex, but that's a modern historical thing. That wasn't the case in every society throughout all time. Um, I don't think that, like, on a fundamental level, women are any more averse to just fucking around for fun than men are. It's basically just what we're taught. And the, the idea that it's inherent or biological, I think, contributes to this feeling of alienation from women that sometimes makes people act a little weird with them a little bit, you know? Mm. Okay, well, let's uh, let's get into that one. Um, so, okay, so you but you so you don't think there's like a the bio, there's a biological reason like you don't think there's any biological reason basically for women to be gatekeepers of sex to be like as you know to be more averse to sex than men. Um, I think it's possible to form biological explanations for the reality that we live in today, uh, mm. but I think that anthropologically and historically evidence for the idea that women have always been like really averse to sleeping around is kind of sparse you know um, monogamy is a social construct after all that kind of was cemented after the foundation yeah, I, I agree with you on that. yeah yeah so i think like honest if you go back like far enough in tribal society i'm pretty sure that it was like 
a lot of the guys are just railing a lot of the girls, and a lot of the girls are getting railed by multiple guys, and just like whoever has the like, just the kids pop out. Nobody knows who the dad is. They raise the the kid as a tribe, you know, just very free flowing like that. I think in a lot of cases, and biologically, we're the same now as we were then. I think that everything built up on top of that is a kind of social framework, which we have to take into consideration. But it's important to know that it's it's not like a, a foundational thing. Okay. I would almost claim the opposite, actually, because uh, if you look at it from a biological perspective, the cost of sex for men and women is largely different. So for, you know, a dude, we have sex, we shoot our load, and that's basically it, right? You know, if we want to be assholes, like we don't have to raise the kid, or if there was no society, we could just get away with it. Uh, for women, you know, again, pre-contraception, which is, you know, not a thing up until recently, before birth control and whatnot, there was a big cost of sex. That was nine months of carrying a child. And then another 18 years or whatever, maybe 14 years of raising the child, right? So if a chick wants to just fuck around, right, that's biologically, you know, not in her benefit. Like, again, the birth control has changed the game largely. Like, now there is no real cause to women to, you know, have a lot of sex. Um, but I think from a biological perspective, like, there was for a very, very long period of time. I mean, would you disagree with that? Well, once you're pregnant, you're pregnant, right? I mean, once you've had sex once as a, as a woman, you know, in a tribal sense, you know, if we're going back to our biological roots, anything you do from that point forward is just, uh, you know, uh, uh, for funsies, I suppose, in a purely biological sense. Um, I, again, I think women were getting pregnant pretty much all the time, especially back then, um, you know, because children died all the time. So you kind of had to replace them quickly. Um, and yeah, it just it seems like it, in, in, you talk about like an 18 year obligation to raise children. But back then they would have raised them communally as well, which would have lessened the individual burden. I agree that in a purely biological sense, there is a greater risk uh, a, a, a cost to, to, to women having sex because they, you know, they actually get pregnant or whatever. Um, but in terms of the way in which that's manifested socially, I, I don't know, especially today with contraception, you know, I think, um, I think, uh, you know, absent social pressures, people will be fucking around pretty evenly. And they do seem to, I mean, you know, it's not like women don't get around, right? Yeah, well, let me just quickly address this uh, in the comments because I think uh, people are misinterpreting my position. Dude, I get it. I know women love sex. I'm not saying women don't love sex. Uh, and I'm certainly not suggesting that women should be not engaging in all the sex they want to do. I'm simply arguing from a biological perspective. Uh, for a long time, they didn't have that luxury, which they do now, which is great that they do. That's one of the good things about modern technology. Um, okay. I mean, okay. I mean, I, this I, I, is totally uh, like unsettled anthropological stuff you know what i mean the, the only point of like i just don't like people hampering on the idea that it's like a fundamental divide you know at at most you know through contraception we've sort of arrived at a point where, where we can engage pretty freely and i think that's nice we have yeah and i do agree that's pretty nice but you still to this day um have women generally speaking being the gatekeepers of sex even if we go to like more liberal societies like scandinavia and stuff like that where there's like very little slut shaming or you know that have pretty like open attitudes towards sexuality, even in those places, like women are still the gatekeepers of sex. Yeah, I think, I wonder how much that can be alleviated given enough time. There have been historical examples of societies in which I think in ancient Greece, depending on the city state, women were considered to be the lecherous and sexually aggressive ones. Um, really? and, uh, yeah, I think I, I, there's there's some conflicting. Anytime you go back far enough, you know, there's going to be a variety of historical accounts. But I think, um, if, if we did truly get rid of the social obligations in either direction, um, I wonder if, uh, I, I wonder what, would that, what that would bring about in terms of like biological parity for people's interest in sex. In terms of how much sex is had, it seems like there's a decent level of parity. In terms of who initiates it or who's expected to initiate it, you know, even in Scandinavia, I'm pretty sure it's socially expected that men still do like the courting. I wonder if given enough time that would kind of fade away. I'm not sure. We'd have to see with time. You know? You'd be surprised. I actually spent some time in Scandinavia. Uh, the common complaint that Scandinavian women have is that they have to do all the work, that the men are like just like super like soy boys or whatever. So like, <laughs> they have to like they have to be the one that makes the move on a guy. Yeah, not so, so fun, is it? Huh? And yeah, now, now you get to suffer. See, now they know. That's equality. Feminism. Mm, but the, the point is, is that um, women in those countries, like they still... I don't know. Like, I, I just don't know how much you could even, um, 
like even if we remove all the social stigma, which I think like in Scandinavian countries is like largely, largely gone. Like I just never seen any example of like slut shaming or, you know, like religion or conservative attitudes in those countries. Like they're super open. Uh, like, you know, like for example, if you're on Tinder in Finland, like you can just be very upfront. You can be like, Hey, what are you looking for on here? And the girl will be like, Oh, just have some fun. You can be like, Oh, cool. Me too. And if you do that in like Latin America or like East Asia, you know, no one's going to answer that question, honestly. So like the attitudes there, I would say are like pretty much like as open as you want, but you're still in those places you have, you know, women being the gatekeepers. And I just wonder how much of that is actually the fact that men, we just have this strategy of like, let's just fuck everything. And I agree. Like sometimes we get to a point, like I've gotten past that point where I'm like, okay, I want to have like a relationship and whatnot. I do have one now, but, um, for a while, it's like men are like, yeah, I just want to, you know, fuck as much as possible versus women are more like, yeah, I want to have fun, but I don't want to fuck a lot of dudes. I just want to fuck one or two right dudes, right? So men are more quantity and women are more quality. Uh, not all the time. It's not an extreme thing, but like generally speaking, that's what I found. Oh, a lot of it is definitely based in what people perceive to be like a desirable outcome, right? For basically everywhere in the world, not everywhere, you know, but in many places at least, a guy who fucks a lot of women is considered very socially successful. Like, you know, right. this was the case even back in like the, 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 like 200 years ago, you know, like maybe you'd be called a scoundrel for it, but there's always been a kind of bias towards sexual proclivity with right. men, whereas with women, that's certainly not the case. Even right now, nobody really celebrates a woman who fucks a bunch of guys because it's considered really easy, which to be fair, hell of a lot easier than fucking a bunch of girls as a guy. So it is easier, you know? There's no longer that like accolade for being a successful, you know, sexual magnate. It's just like, oh, you're easy. Even in very socially progressive countries, this remains the case, at least to an extent. Even in progressive communities, you know, uh, if a guy is very sexually successful, it's something that tends to be celebrated. And if a woman is, it's like, accepted or tolerated because oh, like, you know we're not going to slut shame you but it's not cool the way it is when uh -huh. men do it so a lot of this probably comes down to what people idealize and i'd be willing to bet a lot of the reason guys sleep around with so many women is because they've told themselves that that's part of what it means to be a guy but you have so many of these guys later they're like well these the, you know these fucks didn't mean anything to me and it's like well yeah maybe not you know <laughs> maybe you were just kind of doing that because you thought you had to there are so many conflating factors here it's really difficult to farm any hard answers i mean yeah you're right but it's definitely like a man who's promiscuous is largely treated differently but i think that there is a good reason for that it would be like the same reason why someone who has a big trust fund and they has 10 million dollars like no one's impressed with that but someone who like worked their way up from the slums and they have 10 million dollars it's very impressive because for a man you know, to be super promiscuous, they have to have, they either have to be famous or they need to have like really good social skills and be good with women. Like you can't be like a fat, lazy slob who's socially awkward and, you know, have a high lake count that just doesn't happen. Unless of course you're famous, like you're Jonah Hill or something. Uh, for women, like it takes no skill to, you know, have a high body count. Like literally all a girl would have to do is go on Tinder, put up her photos, even if she's unattractive, and say, hey, I'm DTF, and she can have like five dudes at her door. Like we actually did an experiment. I don't know if you saw it on my channel. We took the photos of like, uh, you know, frankly, an obese girl, right? Like I think 99.9% .9 of guys would find her very attractive, created a profile that was like, hey, you know, I want to meet up with a guy, blah, blah, blah. Not even overly explicit. Uh, within 24 hours, she had 500 matches. Uh, dozens of guys were saying, hey, can I come over? Let's Damn, hang out. Queen. Yeah, so like for her, she could have gotten like 10 dicks like in that one night with like, it, it would take no skill on her part at all. All she has to do really is just like, like follow through on basic text, right? So I do think that there is like a reason. It's just like not that impressive. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a woman being sexually promiscuous and hooking up with a lot of guys. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's just not an accomplishment versus for men, it is in some ways an accomplishment. I, don't, I think it can be too much of an accomplishment. Meaning like, I think you, you don't want to like, derive your self-esteem from the number of girls you sleep with that's kind of weird but like if a guy's like yeah you know i've been with 500 girls you're like okay what is this guy doing like he must have some kind of skill component to it i think there are I, i'm not too impressed with flat body counts because there are a lot of things that can skew the numbers first of all it is undeniable that if you're a woman it's easier to get laid off of tinder or whatever now i'm not just into women i'm pan so 
uh, my my with with gay men on the table, you know, five hundred body count is a by the end of the afternoon type thing. Okay, these these get these these queers are insane. So yeah, my, my, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my perception is skewed a little bit in the you know the communities that I'm in. Um, I, I will I will say though, you know, but wouldn't that actually give you a really good perspective because you you know what guys are like, you know what girls are like, right? Honestly, the only impression that it's really given me, I genuinely do not think it's a difference in how horny or how willing they are. I think the main difference is that gay men aren't as afraid of men, genuinely, because in terms of like, so in 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 terms of like perceived threat. You know, I'm a pretty large guy. I'm a perceived threat to basically anyone. And if they're bottoming, then even more so. I mean, God knows what you could get away with when you're in that position. Um, but uh, the um, it, it, but with 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 a lot of gay men, like they don't have this ingrained fear of men. A lot of women do. And a lot of that's because, you know, they've heard their entire life stories of female relatives or friends who have been abused or assaulted. And I think that it like they, they're, there's like a trust barrier that they need to overcome in ways that men don't. You know, the first time I ever like talk with a guy off Tinder, this is in early college, because before it was just in-person stuff with the guys, you know. Um, they, t I, they told me, you know, you can come on by later tonight. We're having a party, you know. I'll be like in this bedroom. Like, here's the house number. Like, here's the address. What the fuck are you doing? I hadn't even shown this guy my dick yet. And he's already given me his goddamn address, bedroom location, off the front door, unafraid, you know? And I think that fear is a big thing. I wonder if maybe given enough time, if the, you know, things level out a bit, um, maybe that, that fear barrier will lessen and you'll have women who are like way more aggressive about this because they don't have that fear. They'll act like gay bottoms. Mm, I mean, maybe. I, think, I, I do think it's a factor. I, I won't deny that. I do think that fear is a factor. Like sometimes maybe a woman's horny, but then she's like, oh, if I meet up a random guy, you know, uh, there's a risk and i do think quite often women overblow the risk like i think the risk like statistically speaking is really small uh especially if you take certain precautions but there is a risk um and you know a woman is within her within her rights to be concerned there's nothing wrong with that uh, i do agree that there's also a social um social aspect to it uh with slut shaming and whatnot uh more so in some countries less so in other countries uh but in my opinion i think the biggest factor is just simply has to do with the fact that men uh, quite often are just like, yeah, like I want to fuck like a lot of different, you know, I want to have a lot of different partners, right? Like, uh, I mean, I want to fuck like, you know, a girl today, I want to fuck a new girl tomorrow. And I think girls on average are much more likely to get attached when they have sex than men. Some men do too. And some women can have sex without pair bonding. But more generally speaking, women on average don't want to fuck a bunch of dudes. They want to more like have one, maybe two dudes, maybe three dudes that they're fucking uh, but they have more of a connection with those guys rather than just go out and just have a bunch of meaningless sex. So, like, in my opinion, the biggest difference is just comes down to our basically dating and sex strategies and, like, what we want. Uh, because, like, I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, like, the BDSM community, right? But if you go to, like, a swingers club or a swingers party, uh, it's a very safe environment. Like, there's like, like, it's the safest environment ever. There's a bunch of security, like consent is like a huge thing there right you can't even like touch someone without asking for permission uh it's not like a sexual free-for-all which some people think it is uh but even in those environments like when a girl goes there she might have sex with like i don't know like two or three guys or something right but a guy who goes there he'll have sex with like you know they'll just he'll just engage in gang bangs with all the chicks so like the guys there are just still having way more sex with way more partners than chicks are like i, I think first that myself i i don't generally describe, i know there are some women who will just get railed like Seven ways till sundown by eighty thousand. Yeah, you know, yeah. God bless them. You know, I think one of the big differences is actually down to the quality of sex, right? So if we're talking all like straight cis people or whatever, you know, I can hook up with anyone. I'll always come because I'm the guy. I have a dick, right? right? Like I'll, if I just hook up with just some random chick, I will come. You know, she might not, especially not. Um, well, I try. You know, I do my best. But if she's just <laughs> like railing fifty dudes or whatever, like. She's not going to come from a lot of those interactions. And I feel like just yeah. due kind of the physiology of a, of, of, of a pussy in comparison, yeah. maybe the quality versus quantity thing is because guys have a virtual guarantee they're going to nut when they fuck around. But chicks will be looking for people who can actually like effectively satisfy them. And that might yeah. disincentivize because to them, like, oh, I might fuck a new guy this night. But like, will I get the nut from that or will he come in four minutes and then leave? Like, I don't fucking know. So maybe no, there's it, like it, a cost true. benefit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's definitely true. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think also, like, for most women, in order to have an orgasm, 
uh, they need a good amount of comfort. And for some women, a good amount of women, they also need a bit of connection. Like, uh, like for example, for me, right, if there's a hot chick on my bed, we can literally talk zero. Like, we don't even have to communicate at all. I can still have, like, come, like, right, if I fuck her, right? But for most chicks, that wouldn't really be possible. Like, some random dude shows up in their bed with their dick out, even if that guy's, like, super attractive. Like, most of the time, they won't be able to come. Like, they need, like, that kind of connection and comfort. Yeah, some girls can. But like, most, 40 most minutes people- in cowgirl, and then it's, like, rub on the clit in this exact exact way for five minutes and then do this exact holding pattern for eight right. until I right yeah it's a whole thing you yeah, know women are definitely more complicated when it comes to sex it's, it's, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, they make it hard a little bit um I I think I think it's um I wonder a, a lot of that maybe a little maybe a little bit probably some of that is social like the comfort <laughs> thing but some of that's definitely just hard, like full-on like the difference in testosterone versus estrogen or like dicks versus vaginas or whatever yeah i think stuff like that's important to keep in mind as well you know but, but wouldn't that kind of go back to the point that like that is a biological difference between men and women that you know does affect our sexual behavior right yeah though though in in variant sense you know trans women who still have dicks the same thing happens with them so in that case, it's not even a penis thing necessarily. It's like an estrogen thing, which causes the the way in which you have an orgasm to be different or like the whole business with prostate orgasms. This is actually the case with some gay bottoms as well, where in I, I'm trying to think of a more like progressive way of saying this than they basically turn into a woman during sex, but I, I don't really know how to. Like they don't do anything with their dick. Like it's all ass, you know, it, it's, it's the same. It's the same basic thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, but I, I think there is like a big social like tint to it, you know, like if you have people who in a, in, a, in an endocrinological biological sense are basically the same, like myself and a cis gay bottom, but we participate in sex in radically different ways in terms of how we nut and like the ways in which we go about. That's interesting, you know, I don't know how much of that is social or like individual variants, but it's definitely like an interesting uh, range of behavior, you know. Well, let me ask a question like this. Um, we both agree that there's a social element to it and there's a biological element, it sounds like. What I think we might be disagreeing on is the extent. So, like, roughly speaking, like, what's a ballpark percentage to which you would say it's social and what you would say is biological? I don't know. I don't know if I could commit to a percentage, but I would say that like in terms of... Like I, I, I will say definitively that I think that biological differences, interpersonally, between the sexes, whatever, you know, make a significant... Uh, they, they're significantly present when it comes to dating and flirting with people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's definitely like a heavy influence. I think a lot of it is social, more than people are willing to give credit for. And I think a lot of the biological stuff is um, present in elements that can be bridged over with like proper social etiquette in the sense that even if it's different, it can functionally be the same if you know how to handle it and if there aren't any weird social barriers. Okay. Uh, what, what, what do you what do you think are some things like? Let's say you're playing God and you can design a society. Like, uh, what would you do different than like let's say Finland or Sweden or Norway or Denmark um, to make whatever sexual strategies more even between men and women? Like, let's say you have full control of the society. Well, my answer is probably a little bit more radical than a lot of people would go. But I'm a gender abolitionist, so destroying the what? concept of men and women like as a functional social category, I think it'd be really interesting to see how the social categorizations uh play out after that but that would probably be my prescription just just what, what does that mean specifically um basically if you recognize gender and sex as two different concepts and sex is obviously there you know you've got people who grow facial hair and who don't you know whatever um but uh acknowledging those categories the idea of gender being like the um the the collection of social roles built up on top of those i guess the goal would be like if a person is born you know the sex that they're born into is just that it's like well what do you have okay well these are your bits right but in terms of your role there's not really any functional difference between those two no color differences job expectations social roles to fill and that way when people are old enough to really feel out their own personalities they could make their own decisions about what social cliques and groups they want to want to be a part of you know what would you do about the fact that men and women largely gravitate towards different careers? Uh, well, I think a ton of that is social, um, and provably so. You know, you have examples of gender disparities changing after, like, um, uh, uh, the X Files, the Scully effect, where a bunch of women went into um, uh, uh, police work and investigations. 
Um, and you had the fact that computer science was basically 50-50 men women up until computers began to be marketed as a boy's toy. And then when those kids who grew up with those toys got into computer science, it became a very male-dominated field. A lot of it is social. A lot of it isn't. Construction, that's going to be uh, a male game, I think, for pretty much forever uh, with our big, beefy back muscles and shoulders. Maybe people gravitate a little bit more in that way, but we already have that difference right now. Because right now, without any clear gender delineation, tall people are more likely to get into some fields than other fields. But we don't feel the need to separate them into a different gender category, you know? Um, more likely maybe to play baseball or certain types of physical tasks. But we can do that without making, like, these uh, roles for them. Like, oh, you're a tall. That means that you're this and that and so on, you know? I mean, I don't think anyone should be prohibited from doing what they want, but we right now we don't have that. Like a woman can, you know, there's nothing stopping a woman from being a plumber or a uh, mechanic or something like that. Like she can easily do those careers, but they, most women choose not to. And of course there are exceptions to every rule. Um, and same thing, there's like male nurses and stuff like that. But generally speaking, women gravitate towards certain fields and men gravitate towards certain fields, right? Like you wouldn't say there's a big obstacle to women becoming a plumber like that or something, but there's like 99% of the plumbers are male, they're dudes. There's not a legal obstacle. I think there's a strong social obstacle because plumbing is seen as a masculine profession. When people think of the professions that are open to them, they don't think of what they're biologically capable of doing. They think of what they ought to do, or more likely what they're interested in doing. Um, like uh, being an airline uh, steward or stewardess, right? The common historical justification for why all uh, airline assistants were women was because their smaller bodies helped them fit in between the uh, aisle seating. But of course, that's not really true. There are plenty of small men who could fit in there just fine. And now it's starting to reach parity more. But for decades, that was seen as a woman's job, stewardess. Same with um, elementary school teachers, which was for the longest time basically exclusively a women's job. Um, and it, it's been reaching parity recently as well. A lot of what we do and want to do is heavily affected by what roles we're taught are acceptable for the groups of people we belong in, even if there are no legal barriers. And I think that's a kind of implicit coercion that I'd like to see gotten away with, or uh, done away with. I mean, I think, I think there are, yes, I do think social, you know, uh, social implications play roles. I'm not going to deny that. Um, I think we probably heavily disagree on how much of a role they play. Okay, let, let me kind of go to this question. Would you say that there's, would you say like men's brains in a lot of ways work differently? Like, for example, there was a study that came out that women's brains have like 10 times the gray matter of men's brains, right? Which is responsible for like social type of things and empathy and whatnot. So there are like, you have to grant that there are some differences in the way our brains, generally speaking, work uh, between the genders. Like um, it's not just dicks and pussies. If only it was. Um, no, uh, there are absolutely some differences. I don't. I would have to look at the gray matter study specifically. In terms of the biologically ingrained differences, there are definitely some. I don't think they're that significant in the modern world. Uh, the modern world, I mean, most of our behavior comes down to decision making and social engagement. And I think in that respect, we're all pretty equally capable. Um, I would need to see the gray matter thing specifically, but I can look that up after we're done talking. Yeah, sure. I mean, let's, let's take something as, as simple as construction. Uh, you know, like men have a giant advantage when it comes to construction because they can lift more weights, uh, men are on average are a lot stronger, um, and all that. Like, like I still, like you can get away with every possible gender role. Like men are going to have a huge advantage when it comes to women in construction, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. If you, if you were to say like males and females or whatever, though. I, don't, I just don't think it's necessary to ascribe the broader social category. Because we have a lot of rules for men and women that really have nothing to do with actual biological differences. Dresses and suits, for example. There's no reason why women wear dresses and men wear suits. We've just kind of, you know, just, just, that's just sort of the, the expectation we have. You know, pink and blue. It used to be the reverse, you know. Back in um, the 1910s, I believe, pink was actually considered the masculine color bold and virile and blue the passive color was considered feminine until a toy company in i believe manhattan ran out of light blue paint for boys toys and or sorry for girls toys and decided to use pink paint instead and after that the trend shifted um there are a lot of these weird situations and this is the issue i have with evo psych where we post hoc justify differences between men and women in a biological sense when in reality there's just a we're just really complicated animals and there's a lot of stuff that we take for granted when it's totally socially constructed um 
I mean, again, I think there are things that are socially constructed. Um, okay, how about? Um, uh, I, I guess l- let me let me ask the question like this: w- What is the downside to having some sexual polarity? Like, meaning having difference? Like, for example, the um, the, uh, the the example you gave with the suits and women wearing dresses. Like, I don't see it as a bad thing that we dress differently in the sexes. Uh, you know, there's nothing that prevents a woman from wearing a suit if she wants to, right? Like, she can do that. You know, it's not against the law, and it shouldn't be, right? But, I mean, I don't see it as a bad thing that we dress differently. And frankly, I think it would be a little weird if we all dressed the same. Like, if women were, we, like, if men and women dressed exactly the same, like, you don't think that would be kind of bizarre? Well, tall women and short women dress the same, don't they? Don't you find that a little bizarre? Tall and short women? We're only separating by arbitrary categories. I don't want everyone to dress the same. I want people to dress in ways they feel most comfortable. But if you open that up to everyone, I don't think it would suddenly be like everyone would wear the same outfit. I think you would just have different divisions that aren't based on a pre-existing biological construct. I'm a, See, for me, it's just an extension of my anarchist principles. I'm just in favor of radical freedom. If people are going to have preferences for self-expression, I want it to be determined by categories they put themselves in. But gender is tied to sex. and We're born into our sex. So outside of transitioning, that's something that we're just, we have foisted on us, you know? I like masculine things generally. I don't wear dresses, you know? But in a world where I wasn't told for my entire life that men wear suits and not dresses, I have no idea what I actually would like as a pure representation of my personal expression. I have no way of knowing. Yeah, you're you're right. There's no way of knowing that. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess there really is no way to know that. I mean, I doubt that you naturally. Well, actually, yeah, okay. There's there's no way to really determine that. I mean, I think there's really no way to even get there though. Like to make a, like you social programming exists whether we like it or not. Um, I guess like I just don't see the big benefit in pushing for having a genderless society. Like I agree, there should be reasons to uh, remove like gender barriers. Like, you know, like, um, you know, if there was a law that said women can't do this or that, and there are in some countries, I'm like, yeah, we should remove that. I'm fully in favor of that. Um, but pushing people to be like gender neutral, I don't know. I just don't see like how that benefits society. I don't like, want to push sexual anyone. polarity. Hmm? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just want to say, I don't want to push anyone. Um, I, you know, not to, not to come across a hypocrite, you know, I enjoy my masculine predilections when I have them, you know. Um, and I wouldn't say like, oh, well, you should all be gender neutral, you know, because it's socially beneficial. I think it's a long-term goal. Right now, we're closer to that goal than we were 100 years ago when like every guy going outside had like a top hat and a, and a, and a three-piece suit, you know, and women covered their ankles. We've limited the boundaries uh, somewhat. So uh, for me, it's just a long-term goal thing. I think people should live and express themselves however they're most comfortable. If I had a kid and they were like assigned male at birth, I would probably like go by he, him and just say like, you know, you can like whatever you want. Most people are going to call you a boy. So until told otherwise, I'll do the same. Okay. I mean, um, let me bring up this point then. Uh, one key category where there does need to be differentiation for the sake of fairness is sports, right? So for example, uh, you take a dude, like let's take tennis players, right? You take a tennis player who's like ranked 300, he plays Vanessa Williams, he will win, right? That's actually, that's a match that's happened. Mm-hmm. So it'd be extremely unfair to put men in women's categories, even if the way is the same, that would just be like insanely unfair to women, right? So that's like a category, for example, where you, we do need to differ, uh, differentiate by gender. Like, how, how would you get around that? Well, unfairness is the point of sports to an extent because the people at the top of any field are going to be biologically superior at that sport to people beneath them. Right, like in, ter- in terms of fairness, you know, if you went into like the whole like rankings for gymnastics or whatever, the people who perform at the top of the Olympic level are literally physically built differently than the people who perform towards the lower ends. That's not to say that there isn't a reason we separate it based on sex. Um, I, I This is one of those situations where it's like a lesser of five evils type thing. Um, obviously, you're asking about trans sports, you know. I, I, I do acknowledge that the separation of men and women into different athletic categories is generally beneficial because if you didn't do that, men would be at the top of everyone. <laughs> or at there least. There would be no such thing as a female, a successful female athlete. It would be like maybe like some category maybe gymnast i'm yeah, not even like, yeah some some things yeah like something uh, but like 90 like yeah, yeah 98 percent yeah, yeah would yeah. be would, would be guys up there with with the trans sports stuff in particular there's a lot of really interesting um sports research on the effect that medical transition has on your body 
because uh, of course a trans woman isn't isn't the same as a man physically after they've been taking hormones. It destroys your muscles, you know. It it, it tears your body apart. It turns you into something worse than anyone could ever imagine. A woman. Uh, it 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 um it definitely has an effect. Say it again. I kind of missed the very last part. Uh, oh. It does what? Oh, I was I was teasing with the end there. I was making a joke. I was making a misogynistic joke. But the uh -huh. the the um. The hormones definitely have a real effect. Right now, we don't really have an epidemic of trans women dominating women's events, like at the Olympics or at the highest level. It's usually like every six months, there's a big story at like the college level. And mm -hmm. I think they're worth looking at because, yeah, trans women do have some advantages over cis women on a probabilistic level. My main issue is like, how do we handle it moving forward? And usually from my answer, I just say, I wish it would be depoliticized and thoroughly investigated by um, sports medical researchers, because they're the only people who can really answer these questions. And until then, we should take like a light hand touch, because it's like a very low stakes social issue, I think. I agree with you that it's a low stakes social issue. And I agree that it's something that's heavily politicized. I, I grant you both those points. Um, but I mean, I think it's a little unfair to say that it, they have some advantage because like, especially if we talk about combat sports, like it's just a straight, like a reg, like a whatever cis woman, she just, she will get destroyed by like a, a woman who, you know, used to be, uh, you know, a trans woman, right? It's just it, like that. The trans woman has 25, 30 years of testosterone in her system and just largely bigger bones and muscles, uh, you know, in her favor compared to the, you know, whatever the standard woman. Uh, it's just like such not a fair fight. And then furthermore, it creates a safety issue because that woman can just like literally fucking destroy that woman, right? Yeah, the androgen sensitivity that you benefit from when you're when you're a guy, you know, and then you transition later, there are definitely lasting effects in that respect. Um, in terms of how to effectively deal with that, it, it this it's such like a technical issue. I'm not a big sports guy as well, so I'm not totally yeah, like, not versed either. on the, yeah. the rulings there. In terms of like, safety issues i would say like ufc and stuff are going to be a safety issue no matter how you're handling it i know that famous trans ufc fighter was up against a, a cis woman who is larger than her so uh, depending on how the weight categories go it's possible that the relative bone density of a trans woman might mean they get placed against women who have a longer reach because they would have the lighter bones of a of a, of a cis woman I, uh, yeah i don't know it's it's really it's really complicated i don't have a really strong position if it stays depoliticized which it hasn't you know ideally if it was depoliticized and it was being handled by like the researchers in that field that would make me happiest and whatever answers they came up with i guess we could you know try to work with that yeah, I mean, I think uh, the idea that it could be depoliticized is impossible because that will just never happen because everything yeah. gets politicized, unfortunately. Um, but I think like the goal of sports is to be as fair as possible to the most amount of people, right? So that's, for example, they don't have people who weigh 150 pounds fight someone who weighs 250 pounds. It's just like extremely unfair to people who weigh less. And you can never be fair to anyone, everyone, right? There's, there's no way to do it. Uh, you know, you can't have like, for example, a league for 155 pounds, 156 pounds, 157 pounds, right? There has to be some reasonable accommodations made in the interest of, you know, let's just say the sport. Um, so, you know, like there's only so much you could do. But if you take trans women and allow them to compete openly against you know, like cis women, uh, especially in combat sports, uh, that's pretty much the end of cis women, right? So basically, you're, you know, you're, you're benefiting a small percentage of people, but it's being, you're being unfair to a huge amount of, uh, you know, women. So like with the goal of being as fair to as many people as possible, you have to have a different league. Uh, there has to be some separation there uh, in the same way that you separate men and women or in the same way you separate someone that weighs 150 to 250 pounds. Um, and again, like that's not to say I'm like transphobic or something, have anything against trans women. No, it's just simply in the interest of fairness. Like you want to be fair to the athletes. No, I, I agree fairness is important. Um, I don't think we're seeing examples of runaway performance from trans women yet. I mean, we do know that there's a risk of overperformance, but in terms of how they've statistically borne out when you have male athletes transitioning and then have female athletes after like a year or two of hormones, the proportion isn't so significant, I think, that it warrants the level of concern that's been afforded to it. I think I'd be more, I'm, I'm more interested, I think, in seeing how this discourse evolves um, with early transitioners. Because while you do benefit from androgen sensitivity, uh, if you transition after you've experienced a male puberty, that's not the case if you uh, took hormone blockers and then transitioned without having ever experienced a male puberty. So it's possible that eventually trans women 
are literally like biologically going to be completely on par with cis women or worse because they're getting so much so much estrogen in their bodies um but but it'll just take it'll just take t time to find out i think so and we'll just have to see where it goes i don't think we can make a separate um category for them because there are so few like trans athletes like there's like four in the state of utah maybe like a handful in california it's, it's not it's not that much right so it's, it's not that much. It'll never be as popular as like regular sports. But we do this with like, for example, the Special Olympics and people who have disabilities. There's not that many disabled athletes, but you know, we still like don't ask you know people in wheelchairs to compete against like basketball players who can walk, right? That's just there's no way someone in a wheelchair could do. And that's an extreme example. That's for um, their benefit, though, right? I mean, that would be like a, a self segregation, whereas trans people want to perform in the in the divisions that they're they're choosing for. I don't think well, a person I'm, with a wheelchair but, would want to play basketball against a person who can walk. Right, but that inherently makes sense because the person in the wheelchair, he would you know, get annihilated by someone who can walk no matter how good he is at shooting or doing free throws versus the trans person has an advantage, you know, uh, biological against a woman who's cis, right? So it, it makes sense why one category would not want that and one category would want that. Like humans are inherently pretty selfish and we want to do what's best for us. So... I wouldn't expect trans women to be like, oh, like, please keep us separate, right? Like, why would they? Like, they're athletes, let, they want to win. Let me ask you then, because I'm curious. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, now I'm going to simplify this a bit because it's obviously so complicated, oh. but let's say that trans women are, on average, let's say uh, the five to 10 more effective at whatever sports field they're in um, than cis women are of the same Five, 10 X or five, 10%? Five, 10%. Because right okay. now the evidence we have is minor and spurious. So to say they're massively outperforming just doesn't, it's not justified by the evidence we have. Now, five to 10% ain't nothing, you know. How, um, how big a percentage would there have to be, uh, before you would say like, oh, this is acceptable. I think trans women should be able to compete alongside cis women. Because I think black sprinters outperform white sprinters by a statistically significant amount. But you would never say, like, we should have a white sprinters category because otherwise we'll never have, like, a white sprinter win at the Olympics, you know? Yeah, I, I see your point. Um, well, first of all, I would heavily disagree that it's only 5%, 10%. Like, for example, I, I agree there's not hasn't been too much, like, studies done, but there are have been a lot of anecdotal stuff. Like, there was this one uh, female MMA fighter. Uh, I mean, sorry, trans MMA fighter who fought against a bunch of women, and she was like, like before she transitioned, she was into MMA, and she was just, she, she was like a fairly average fighter at best, like she wasn't good, and then she just started like destroying, like destroying like some of the top women in the sport. Eventually, there was one uh, uh, cis woman that beat her, but she was like because this cis woman was like so fucking good, uh, but she was just like destroying all these like women who are ranked like much better than her. Uh, and I think there's been countless examples like that. In terms of what actual percentage, it would be really hard for me to pinpoint. Again, I'm also not a big sports guy. Um, if it was only truly like 5%, 10%, which I really don't believe it is, um, I would say that's not that significant. Like, let them compete uh, together. If it was like truly 5%, 10%. Uh, but I don't think it's 5%, 10%. I think it's like way more than that. I think it's more than 25%. I think it's a huge, huge uh, advantage. And I think part of it depends on the sport. Uh, that edge will depend on the sport. Like something like tennis, for example, is not going to be some, so, uh, you know, something as significant as MMA. Um, so you'd have to look at it that way. But in, in terms of me, it's just like, how can you be fair to the most amount of athletes? Uh, let's say there's, uh, no, let's just try to simplify things. There's a hundred trans MMA fighters and 10,000 trans, uh, whatever, female cis fighters, uh, like I would say, well, how can we, we, someone has to get, someone has to be kind of mm, handled in an unfair manner. Let's handle the most amount of people, like the 10,000 women, and let's try to be fair to them. And yes, I understand that like, that might not be perfectly fair to the hundred, uh, you know, whatever, uh, trans women. Like, I'm not saying we should ignore them. Like, let's compete. Let's create a league for them. Like, let's let them compete. Maybe we could dedicate some government funding to that. Like I'm not opposed to any of that, but putting them together, with like regular with, with a trans whatever cis woman that's just like so unfair to like these female athletes who've been competing for so long and have spent their whole life like trying to build that up um i don't know if we're necessarily disagreeing on much but yeah that would be it like would, kind of it would just thought. really it would come down to the empirics i don't think the science at the moment currently supports the idea that a trans woman who's undergone a year or two of hormone therapy is um is, uh, is is significantly outperforming cis women i mean after all even if trans women were 
biologically um, exactly on par with cis women, eventually, statistically, they would still win events because, of course, cis women, despite being cis women, win events. Um, it's really difficult to make these cases statistically with, like, spurious anecdotes because that's always what the news does, right? It's like, well, focus on this one case. You know, we're talking about large groups of people. It's impossible to know, and the circumstances differ so much. It'd be like trying to find out what the average height of an American is by, like, like finding, like, a Mexican woman in LA, like a white chick in, in, in Albuquerque, and, and like pulling, it's like, oh, well, I guess the average height is like five fours. I don't know. Um, but uh, in, in terms of like where to go forward, I mean, it seems like you're, you're, you're interested in like the evidentiary results, which, which is what matters to me. Um, more research will come out in this in a short length of time, I'm sure, because it's so widely discussed. And I think I'll probably have a more definitive position when that, um, when, when we have a better understanding of the effect uh, that estrogen has on the male uh, athletic capabilities. I think also the problem is some things are really hard to objectively research. And like, I guess I'm just curious, like how would, how would you objectively even research this? Well, there's, you can do it biologically and endocrinologically. Um, you can look at relative levels of bone density and muscle mass. You can look at actual performances done in lab results from uh, trans women who have been transitioning for a certain length of time. And you would have to do like a multivariate uh, regressive analysis with these factors, cross-reference to what types of hormones they've taken, how long they've taken them, the size of their bodies, how receptive they've been. It would be, to your credit, unbelievably complicated. Um, it would be complicated, but it could be done because there's such a small amount of trans athletes. It is the true. Sample size is so small. Uh, yeah, exactly. Which is why it's especially difficult right now. It is something that can be done, and I know that because there are already preliminary results that have like a few hundred participants that were uh, that that you can look at and take a look at like uh, testosterone levels over time and like sprint distances and stuff. And I'm just interested in seeing that data field expand. Yeah, I think unfortunately, though, sometimes like people have a tendency to want to see data for everything. And that's not necessarily a bad thing in any stretch. But um, for some things, it's like really hard to get the data and data can always be like, it really depends on how the study is conducted. A lot of studies have an agenda. And for some of the things that we want to see data on, uh, it may be a pipe dream, like we'll never actually see objective data on those things. And I think for better or for worse, this might be no for worse, this, this would be one of them. Well, I, I guess think, we'll find out. Hey, uh, in, the, in the meantime, it's Thing. It's yeah. so hyper politicized anyway. Nobody's going no, to listen to the researchers. Yeah, so. yeah. We, we can move on to the next point. I don't think we're disagreeing on like too, too much. I mean, basically, your position is that like uh, TBD. Like, I want to see more info before I. Make I do. A hard For the test. moment, I think the info supports integration because the results are pretty spurious and minor. But obviously, there hasn't been that much research on the subject, so we'll we'll have to see. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. Let's move on to the next thing. Um. Okay. I guess like, is there anything else that you disagree with the red pill pickup community on? Um. I think there's a lot of resentment towards women in these communities, but that's really going to depend on creator by creator. That's not, I, I don't like, that's not like a completely ubiquitous part of the program or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, because the perception for a lot of them is that women are like um, the gatekeepers of sex, which socially they totally are right now, at least. Um, so there's like this resentment, like, you know, I'm a cool guy. Like these chicks aren't even that interesting. Why won't they fuck me? And Lord knows I felt those frustrations at times, like, especially when I was younger. Because it's like, oh my god, like, what, like, why not, right? Um, but as I got older, I guess, and I talked to more women in like friendly context, um, I, I didn't really realize how much head math is going on in them when like guys approach them or flirt with them. So much like, is this person a threat? Do they only want me for my body? You know, will people think that I'm a slut if I sleep with this person? And it's it's like really consequential for them. So I, I got a lot more sympathetic when I when I realized that. I mean, I think no one's entitled to anything like I'm, I'm not entitled to sex from a woman and a woman's not entitled to money for me. Like there's no like, you know, we're not entitled to each other's time or property or body or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, that's just a problematic mindset if you like feel like you're entitled to a woman's pussy or whatever. Um, but yeah, I don't think we're, there's any disagreement there. Anything else that stands out to you? Um, actually, I want to ask you if you're out on a date and you're getting a meal, do you, do you split? Do you take it all? How, how do you pay? Um, generally speaking, well, are we talking about on a date with like a brand new chick I've never met before, or like with my girlfriend? Who uh, let's talking? let's say first date. Um, generally speaking, I will pay. Um, uh, simply because not because like I feel like I have to, but 
Um, a good amount of girls will get like annoyed if you don't. And I'm just not like, I'm not going to grandstand over 30 bucks and like potentially like lose the hookup um, just to like make a point. So um, I have no problem, like whatever, like, I, you know, we, I typically don't go out to dinner on first day, so we'll go out to drinks, like, you know, it's 20 bucks, whatever, like I'll just pay for it. Uh, also, I live in Miami, uh, Latin culture is very predominant there. And, oh, uh, how's Latin the weather over there? Is it crazy hot down there right now? No, man, it's actually really good. It's really nice. <sighs> where where are you at? Here in Seattle. Okay, so. Oh, you're in Seattle? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so in Latin culture, like it's much more custom for the man to pay versus if I lived in New York, maybe like more girls would offer. Um, so I just go with it. Like I'm not going to grandstand on that. In New York, the girls offer and then they ask if they can fuck you. Yeah, uh, it's uh, bombastic. Um, <laughs> it's no, I, I, I totally get that. I mean, I'm, I'm basically the same. Also, my, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm usually doing a little bit better than like the Tinder chicks. Or whatever so like i'll pay oh. i'll pay on that basis back when i was a college student though i would always try to split mostly uh -huh. because i felt yeah, like if they threw a fuss over it it wasn't really worth talking with them further anyway yeah i have had some like pretty heated debates with like uh certain like feminist chicks uh one specifically i don't know if you know her ask nelly um and we weren't even disagreeing on much but she took massive issue when i said that i don't think women are entitled to a man's money just like on a date. Like, so for example, I go out on a date with this Asnelli chick. Like, it's not automatically, like, it shouldn't be automatically assumed that I pay. Like, I should pay because I want to. I have like the kindness of my heart, not because I have to. Like, there shouldn't be like some social obligation. And she took real issue with that, uh, even though I did say that I always pay anyway. Um, so, yeah. No, oh, no, 100%. Like no, fuck that. If there's ever, if there's ever a chick who gets like uppity about that shit, yeah, absolutely. That's such a red flag, too, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, if it, with with the whole like expectation to pay, especially when it's a gender thing as well, I just think the person who's who's doing better should should pay. You know, and, and if both people are like in about the no. same position, they can they can split that. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm looking at your chat as well, and I just somebody said, I wonder if he pays on a gay date, rolling on the floor laughing emoji. Yes, I do. I pay for the gay dates as well. Just How does that going. work? Actually, just out of curiosity. Uh. You just like probably split the bill or flirting with men or like just with men in general just yeah, like no, splitting who, the bill who, who pays yeah um yeah i i usually pay because the youtube stuff has been doing pretty mm. good for me so oh, I, oh. I feel like it's unfair otherwise a lot of them are like gay college students so these people are probably having to like suck dick for weed money so I'm, i don't feel oh. i i don't want to i don't want to be an additional strain on their uh on their finances uh, yeah. Um, um, yeah no i don't think we're disagreeing much on that front uh but yeah yeah we, we got into like a real heated debate uh, which, which is ironic because she was making the claim that, oh, it's so fucked up when men feel they're entitled to a woman's pussy after the day. And I was like, I agree. Like, you know, uh, just because you go on a date with a man doesn't mean you have to fuck him. But just like because we get drinks with you doesn't mean you have to pay for it. And she saw a massive double standard there, I guess, which was bizarre to me. Um, so I'm glad you're not. No, I totally fucking there. agree. I actually got fucked over like that once. This was um, I was in high school at the time, so I was too young to like know better or whatever. But there was a, a chick at my work who was really cute uh and was also uh not that bright i mean i like i didn't enjoy talking to her but she was like cute you know um but we would talk sometimes at work and she asked if i wanted to get dinner sometime and i thought that she was like interested in me and she ch I, I was just like okay so where's the address i went over there and it was a fucking fancy restaurant i'm in high school it was like a candles on the tablecloth restaurant and i and I, I'm, I'm i'm sitting there and i'm like I, I, I'm looking ac across the table at her, and I'm like, wow, you must make a lot more than I know about to afford to go here. And she's like, wait, I thought you were paying. And I was like, is there fast food nearby? And we left. <laughs> we got fast food. That um, bitch. Yeah, uh, I thought she like that happened. I was in Colombia once, um, and I met up with this chick, and she's like clearly like like a gold digger. Like it was just like, she took me to like the fanciest bar. She's like, oh, can we go here? I love this place. I'm like, okay. And like the fanciest bar in Colombia is still like a cheap bar in Miami. So it wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's just like fucking just downing drinks, like just so fucking rapidly. Like she's just trying to fill up on like Patron. And then she was also going to the bathroom every five minutes doing lines of blow and then saying, oh, it's my stomach. Like as if it's not really obvious when someone does coke. Um, so like after like four or five of that, I was like, um, are you in a rush to get drunk or something? She's like, no, haha, it's okay. Whatever. And she just like implied that I was going to have to pay for the whole thing. So I was like, fuck this chick. So I went to the, I went to the bartender when she was in the bathroom doing her little lines of blow. I was like, Hey, let me close out my tab, but I'm just going to pay for my drinks. I only had one, one shot of tequila. And then I, uh, I watched from the bar as the bartender delivered 
her part of the check to her. Dude, I cannot make this up. She had like a little temper tantrum. She did one of these and then she's like, ah, and then literally, I shit you not, she walked over to this really old looking white dude, just like some sugar sugar daddy type of dude, sat next to him and started flirting with him. Yeah, just right, just like right, right. straight, straight, like over, just beelined over to like the oldest, whitest dude that she found and sat down next to him. I'll never forget it. Jesus. It was like, it was it, such a mind fuck. It's Sigma on both accounts, right? Because on your hand, like closing the tabs good, but on her hand, like the shamelessness behind imme immediately just running to the next guy uh, you know it's whew yeah uh <laughs> fuck you know this is another thing about being a, a, a queer you know it's that the gays i think they do this a lot less the game is played differently with queer people even yeah. like um like if it's with a girl or whatever like if she's pan and you're pan or whatever the game of interaction is very very different than like straight girls i do not like straight girls i would take like uh bisexual girls any day of the week like massively mm. over straight girls um not but, to say uh, they wouldn't do that, but, that yeah how, how does it work if you're mommy asking like what, do you just like some days you feel like going out with chicks some days you feel like going out with dudes like what is uh like how does it how does it work for you oh it's just not that much of a difference for me really i've been i've been on delay right now because i have you can see i i got a surgery in my ear so you know i'm not like going hanging out with people with a fucking tampon in my ear but um uh you know apart from that it's really just like no functional difference because in, in either case like the guys are bottoms right so they're basically women socially you know you tell a loud joke they laugh and put their hand on yours you know they they're in doggy you know they're the one bending over. it's it's the same it's i just it's it's just it all blurs together it's as long as everyone's having fun because mm, for me there's like zero like like, there's just, like, nothing that would, like, you know, like, turn me on. Like, you know, like, being, like, I know there's a lot more chicks who are by. Like, there's a lot more chicks who are in the middle. I only know one other guy that I've ever met who was kind of, like, who was a dude who was by. So, that's that's interesting. Uh, but, okay. Um, well, let's move on to, I guess, this. Um, you have a video about incels, which I thought was interesting. Um, I wanted to hear your theory. Why do you think incels are on the rise? Um, I think it mostly has to do with the internet and economic inequality. Um, I think the basic gist of it, I think, is that it's way easier to find friends online than it is to find friends in person, obviously. Like, it's so much easier, you know? Um, but friends in person are, like, biologically necessary for people. We, we need that feeling. And all the social spaces where we used to do that to make friends have been, like, carved out. They're, they're not, you know, it used to be like these public squares, you know, people, uh, they, they get to know people at their job, right? Or like school or whatever. School still works, but as for the job, you know, everyone works the gig economy now. So you don't have this one like office you work at for 20 years. You bounce around like Uber gigs when you're not working at like this one pizza joint for six months Aww. to the next. And it's like, it's bullshit. You can't find anyone. The managers tell you not to like talk with the other coworkers. Flirting with coworkers, even if it's mutual, is discouraged. School, like you're too young and hectic to get anything down. And you have all this shit that's keeping you from making friends, forming relationships. And then it's like, yeah, no wonder people have like completely doomer attitudes towards oh. hooking up or getting laid. Like that's obviously gonna happen. It's really, really sad. And, and you know, I think it's a huge social failing and it's mostly a white person thing too. In Latin communities, this is less of an issue because the strong oh. emphasis on family and friends through family helps a bit. White people tend to be a bit more alienated. I think being wealthier can also hurt because you tend to live in suburbs then and suburbs don't really have places you can walk to. There's a lot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm totally rambling. There's so much no, that goes into it. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's a huge problem. Uh, yeah, I agree. That's a huge problem. Here, I'll, let me just tell you my theory. And you can tell me whether you agree or disagree with it, because I've thought about this a lot. Mm -hmm. I think it. I think all the things you say play a role for sure. But I think it primarily comes down to two things. I think the biggest one is that technology has changed the dating game. Uh, women tend to want, and I guess it's not just women, we all want to date up. Like for example, if you're a guy who's a five, you wanna get a chick who's like a seven, right? Like we, we want the biggest and best thing, uh, generally speaking. Uh, but for women, that's a lot more feasible. Um, so, you know, let's just say like 20 years ago, you're a chick living in Ohio, uh, you know, maybe you want like to, uh, you know, rich, famous guy. But if you want that, you have to fly yourself out to L.A., go to a bar, hope you run into one. It's not that easy. Right. So you're most likely we're usually kind of lazy as humans. So most likely she'll just want up dating some guy from her local town versus now 
in her DMs, if she has an Instagram, there's 50 rich guys from LA DMing her and saying, hey, I'll fly you out. You don't have to do anything. Please, please come, right? So it's a lot easier for her to basically do what she wants to do, which is date up, have a more successful guy, right? Which, unfortunately, because she's now with that successful guy, that leaves that one guy in Ohio uh, behind. And when that happens all over and over again, you have a lot of guys that are left behind, right? So I think for like the guys at the top 0.1%, like the celebrities or the athletes or the guys who just have a lot of like status for whatever reason, uh, it's never been easier to get late. Like those guys are getting more pussy than ever, uh, you know, because again, technology has changed the game. Like let's say you were a celebrity 30 years ago, how would you get late? Well, maybe some chick recognizes you on the street. Maybe you get some fan mail and you write to her and like maybe she comes and visits you, you get her plane ticket versus now you have pussy coordinators who just go through your incoming DMs and organize like pussy appointments for you. Like it's never been easier. But again, like, you know, let's just say pussy is somewhat of a finite resources. So if the guys at the very top are getting more than ever, that kind of leaves out space for the guys at the bottom, right? I think that's the first reason. I think second reason uh, goes back to, you know, the documentary, The Social Dilemma, is the internet has made things a lot more polarizing. So let's say you have a bad date and you go on the internet and say, well, you're, you're pissed off and type in, why do women suck? The algorithm is going to take note of that and start feeding you that info. And then, you know, you're, just, you're seeing like insult content after insult content after doomer content. And then you become convinced that everyone else has the same issue. Right. Because the algorithm for you, you know, your YouTube feed looks radically different than my YouTube feed because you just get fed this Doomer type of content and then you get convinced. I've like debated a lot of these Doomer guys and they're convinced that like this is the reality for every guy. I'm like, dude, it's not the reality for me. Like, you know, like I have pretty good success with chicks. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I think those are the two big factors. I'd be curious to see if you agree or disagree with that. Yeah, there's a lot there that I agree. I mean, this is basically like um, hypergamy, right? The idea that you have like a disproportionate ability to fuck women when you're the very like up there guy and then that kind of fucks over people in the bottom echelons i i think so uh, leaving aside the essentialist bits you know even if we assumed everything here is social there are going to be imbalances as a product of different propensities towards sleeping around with men and women um uh, given the fact that men feel less social pressure to remain sort of chaste uh you're going to have this um this skew towards the top that I that I agree with. I think there are ways around it, or at least ways to mitigate it. Um, but they're not ways that people always like, um, in my opinion. At the end of the day, of course, people should be able to fuck who they want. So yeah. what we're dealing with is a consequence of free choice. It's just about right. streamlining what people want to make it so that what people want is as um, compatible as possible with what other, other people want. And I think... Um, the two big things here that I think are really important for overcoming this disparity, um, one of them is that I think it's really important to have female friends who are just your friends. I've noticed that a lot of the channels through which women hook up and find partners and fuck around and whatever are kept kind of closed circuit relative to men. Like men will go online or Tinder no, and scream uh, into their phones uh, about, yeah, yeah. But a lot of women, yeah. it's like you you need like an in or a vet. Yeah. And in my mm -hmm. experience, and you know, I'm 28, I haven't lived the whole like lifespan or whatever. But so far, every group of friends that I've been in that has had more than one woman, there are people in there that are single and like looking to fuck. Maybe not necessarily you, but somebody. Meaning that maybe there's just a difference in how loud everyone's being and being sort of proximate can open up opportunities that wouldn't be present otherwise. Not to say you should only make friends with girls because of that. Just it's it's good to not only interact with women in efforts to fuck them. Uh, it's okay to just be friends with some of them. <laughs> There's some pretty cool girls out there. Um, the other one I think is non-monogamy. This could be my bias again because I'm, um, I'm queer. So, and also non-monogamous. So, you know, whatever. But um, I feel like, especially like for younger, age demographics, like up to 30 or whatever. Um, a lot of people on Tinder or anything else, men, women, whatever, just kind of want to fuck around and they have looser attitudes towards the rigid attitudes towards the rigidity of relationships. And while I'm not saying that you need to have a girlfriend and the girlfriend is like, hey, I want to fuck like 50 other guys and you have to say yes. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that being a little more open with non-conformity towards other people's relationships might make it a bit easier to get into certain venues. Anyway, it's it's a very broad thing, but those are two things that um, I've noticed. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're disagreeing on much. I mean, I definitely agree with the first thing you said is that uh, there are all these like like kind of closed loop social circles that 
uh, where it's really easy to get late, but you need like an in. You can't just like get in like if you're a random person. And that, yeah, I do think that women are a lot less loud about it, but they might be just as DTF, if not more. And uh, I speak that from experience because I've been part of some of those social circles. Like I've had like situations where like I fuck one chick and she's like, you know, she's like really happy. And then she like introduces me to her friends and I fuck her friends. Right. And it's like that sort of thing, which but I only got the friend because I knew that chick like the friend was like maybe so sketched out about meeting a new person that she would have never done it if I didn't have that in. Like that's the only reason I was able to meet up with that chick who was actually like super horny, but she was also like really sketched out about meeting strangers. So uh, I agree with you on that point. Um, I think the second point you made about, uh, you know, and I'm also non-monogamous, like more or less. So it's not like we have a large personal difference, but um, I think like the swinger lifestyle or those, those type of environments, like I think, I don't know. I, I don't think like most people that would work for most people. Like, I think most people are just like not that sexually comfortable or whatever. Uh, I could be wrong on that. I don't know. No, I, I think that's true. It's a comfort thing. You know, I, if, if you're uncomfortable with that, you should never, um, never force yourself to, Oh, I will say this. This is actually really good advice. I'll stick by this one. Okay. I'm, I'm willing to bet most of the men, well, most everyone is, but especially in the dating, uh, like, uh, you know, dating advice scene are probably straight. Um, because Lord knows if they were gay, you know, you only need so much advice there. Gay men are very horny, but, um, I feel like yeah. participating yeah. in queer communities is, makes all of this so much easier. When I said earlier that st I don't like straight girls as much as like bi girls or whatever. One of the reasons for this is because so much of the whole, like how men treat women and how women treat men dichotomy is built up specifically in the framework of heterosexuality. Even if you're straight, you know. Uh, there are local queer bars and queer clubs or whatever, and it's not like a big deal or whatever. You just walk around. There are just more gay areas of town than others. And the attitudes towards dating there tend to be a lot more free form. And I don't, like, they're, 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 you don't have to, like, lie and pretend you're gay or some shit, but, like, there are so many, what do you call it, culturally gay, sexually straight guys that I know. They only want to fuck women. They're only into women, okay? But you go to, like, you know, you hang out with them or whatever, and they are just... The game is just entirely different, and I think it. I think it's a little bit healthier too, um, because are you people about, are like straight guys who would go to like a gay club or something. Is that what you mean? Yeah, like unironically, yeah, because gay clubs aren't just for gay guys. I no, mean, it's, I get that. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No, that's 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 a, that's a really fair point. Like, I've actually like you know I'm completely straight, but I've been to gay clubs like in LA. They're actually a really easy place to pick up girls. Yeah, because a lot of chicks are there. Uh, they go with their gay friends. They're just there to hang out. Uh, and you know, there's not a lot of straight guys around, so you don't have much competition. Also, the environment is very sexual, so they're more like kind of in that zone. So yeah, I, it's I very it's freeform, and all the barriers about how men are supposed to behave with women kind of break well, down because a lot of the guys are gay and a lot of the girls are lesbians, meaning that the inherent preconceptive divide is not really there. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying you should invade your local gay bar to like, like find the women there or whatever, but just these, cu these cultures and communities tend to be a bit more freeform. And I think that makes it a lot easier. I all, look, all I know is I've completely given up on like aggressively pursuing straight women. I'll swipe left in that shit, no matter how hot she is. You know, if the bio is just like some blonde on, on like a, my, like a Miami beach deck, you know, and she's like upper middle class and there's nothing on her profile that's gay. Yeah. You know, fuck that. I don't care because it takes so long. Um, but if you, you know, talk with, uh, uh, queer people, they're, they're pretty cool. They're funny too. I think funnier, um, um especially is that because you feel like the, you know, whatever the boring white, ch white blonde chick, she's going to play hard to get, or what's like the reason for that? Well, I don't like that. Yeah. It, Cause if you're it, listen, in my experience, and again, a lot of my, um, biases here because of this, if I'm talking to a straight chick, there is that whole fucking game. Like you, you can uh -huh. get through like multiple screen lengths of phone texts before right, it's, yeah. there's, there's a big element of game. Yeah. 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 And it's, uh, and that I hate that What's a lot of this. Yeah. I, I'm autistic. I just, I don't, I don't have patience for any of this, you know, but in, with a lot of queer girls or whatever, and you can tell cause they've got pink hair or some shit, right? But you match with them and you, you, you're, you can do like, Hey, so what do you want Tinder for? And they're like, Oh, I'm looking for this, you know? And you can be like, yeah, you know, I'm just in the air. I'm looking for people who are like down to fuck or whatever. Are you, at, are you down to fuck? And like nine times out of 10, they're like fine with that avenue of questioning. It's just instantly you can get to the point. And that is so relaxing compared to the, the you know, the bullshit. Yeah, you, you and I are actually the same in that regard. I also hate playing the game, even though that's basically what I teach on my channel. I'm good at it, but I don't like playing it, at least not at this point in life. Like, one of my biggest turn-ons is when the chick is just, like, really into me and makes it, like, really easy. That's, like, my biggest turn-on is, like, just high levels of compliance. 
Uh, and like for me, it's a massive turnoff if a chick is like making it difficult for me. Like I think a lot of guys get a kick out of that. They want to like overcome the challenge. Uh, and I think I might have been like that when I was younger, but that's gone away a lot. Like I don't I don't like that anymore. Like if a chick makes it like too difficult, I'll just like call her an Uber and call a night. I just like don't want to like spend hours playing the game. I just like for me it's such a turn on when a chick is like so into me and it's just like I think you're really hot, Alex. Like can you fuck me now? Like that's that, I love that shit. And it's straightforward. And to me, it's almost like the archetypically female equivalent of guys who can't open up about their feelings, right? Like if I have a, a guy friend, you know, and something's on their mind, like you can talk with me, bro. I'm right here. Like, you know, hit me up. What's up? You know, and no. a lot and in the same way, I wouldn't want to have to work through like five days of built up social, like calcified resistance on like, no, I feel fine. You know, I also don't want to talk with a cute girl and have to deal with like eight, you know, million years of built up aversion to being openly sexual i would just i'd rather get to it and if she can't express enthusiastic interest anyway i mean that's like the whole fun right i don't like uh, fuck the challenge i hate the challenge what, what yeah, I mean, ch challenge like to fuck, fuck that you yeah, know yeah. who cares um, we're the same in that regard yeah i don't like it either yeah i don't yeah. a lot of guys really do a lot of guys genuinely do for them it's a turnoff or a chick makes it too easy like i don't think they're lying like i've had many of my friends say that but for me no like i hate the challenge i hate the fucking yeah it's a massive turnoff like i just get turned off the more difficult it gets. Like if a girl wants me to chase, I can do it. I just don't want to. Um, yeah. So we're the same in that regard. But let, let me move on to this. Uh, I think this is one thing that we're going to disagree on. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's kind of a different topic, but I think on the dating stuff, we're actually not as different as probably most people would think. Um, you, you're not a fan of Jordan Peterson, right? No, I'm not. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of gathered that from your video. Uh, so I'll preface this by saying I'm not like some Jordan Peterson fa uh, fanboy. Uh, I think he's kind of overrated in a lot of regards. Um, and I don't think he says anything that's like radically super insightful. Like I think he's a smart guy, but he's, I don't think he's like laying out some groundbreaking philosophy. Uh, however, I do very much find your claim that he's a fascist kind of problematic. Um, so uh, do, do you truly believe that or was that you just being hyperbolic? I think, I think that he enables fascism as a, as a social movement. He personally focuses too much on hyper individualism for me to fairly categorize him as a fascist. If I said he's a fascist, like in that language specifically, then that was incorrect of me. Okay. Um, I, I do, yeah, I do think he he sort of enables that trend, though. Um, can you clarify, like, in which way does he enable it? Um, well, I think it's there are a couple of tenets. The biggest one by far is his insistence on the defense of Western civilization against outwardly corrosive forces. He's a big fan of the um, the cultural Bolshevism conspiracy theory, or cultural Marxism, they call it today, which was a Nazi conspiracy theory about how Western civilization is being eroded from within by an elite group of academically unkind, you know, subversive types, and they're trying to make people anti-white and this and that, you know. Um, stuff like that really, really bugs me. It, there's, do you there's, think, uh, oh, yeah, sorry. sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to clarify. Do you think that he overblows it or that he's completely wrong about that? Or he's just like overblowing it? I, I think he's completely wrong. I think what he's referring to is just the, the progressive force that made Western civilization good to begin with. Because I feel like if he'd been around 400 years ago, he would have called like the enlightenment thinkers that exactly. Because if we're ever talking about... Uh, elite intellectuals undermining the tradition of Western civilization. Okay, Voltaire is right up there at the top. You know, the Enlightenment thinkers are right up there at the top. Um, you know, teaching us to hate our monarchs and so on. I, I think it's basically it's it's just a, a a reaction to progressivism that is being framed through the logic of civilizational conflict. I think that's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in some, look, I, I, my, my opinion is that he heavily overblows it. I don't think there's like this big conspiracy or like it's prominent, but there are elements of it, which I think are, uh, small, but they do exist like of like, you know, like some anti-white sentiment, like, you know, I've, I've met chicks like that, like, and it's really bizarre to me or like on TikTok, you see it a lot. Like, oh, you're a white guy. Fuck you. Like automatically. Like, okay. Sorry for being born white. Like, let me call my parents and ask for a refund. Like that sentiment does exist. I don't think it's nearly as prevalent. But would you say it just doesn't exist at all? Like, oh, oh no, it, it totally exists. Yeah, okay. I mean, the um, it's existed for a long time, right? I mean, when the slaves were on the plantation, I imagine a lot of the words they exchanged when they're, uh, you know, uh, the, the the white benefactors. Yeah, they probably weren't too happy about that. Yeah, they're probably a little unhappy. Um, yeah, I totally. Yeah, it's. I I think. By the way, I think it's super cringe. Um, 
this the oh, anti white like the actual anti white bullshit or whatever. You know, no. I'll make jokes. I I love my edgy jokes. I love my race jokes. Um, no, but there are people who clearly like actually don't really like white people that much. I think no. it's super cringe. No, um, I but I think it's important to understand that um, while that sentiment is really really bad it's not really a, a a component to a broader social force against white people whereas if you look at other forms of prejudice like sexism or anti-black discrimination you can see like really marked social trends even if those are legal discrimination today there's like very clear patterns or like lines left in the ground as a product of that which warrant more engagement if the anti-white stuff ever became civically like relevant then i think it should be pushed back against as aggressively yeah, no, I, I do think he and like somewhat similar people who are like in that category tend to overblow it. Like, I don't think it's like nearly as prevalent as they think it is. I think more of what is a more valid concern is the uh, push against censorship and uh, cancel culture, which I think is very real and something I've experienced. Like today, I got my TikTok taken down, oh, uh, I'm sorry. which is super, super fucking annoying. Uh, but that, like, that is one thing that I think does exist, and it's like heavily, heavily on the left. Like that is an issue that exists, like primarily on the left. Um, like you would agree, that's like an actual issue that like has social consequences, right? Um, I think it's an issue, but I don't really think it's a left bias thing. I think in terms of cultural markers, I mean, people of all political persuasions are going to try to say like you know take this down here and take this down here but i think i think the main difference is that the right makes an actual legislative effort to uh restrict speech you know they've been banning books from schools recently um you've, you've been having these laws that are trying to like censor discussion of like uh, uh like gay people in like elementary school or whatever like you can't mention it stuff like that Th these are very legislatively relevant but usually when it's like what's going on cancel culture wise from the left it's like accounts get taken down for overstated cases of hate speech i've been banned from from twitch twice actually the second time it was because i said honky which is a racial slur. You know? no, no. Yeah. So, uh, you know, not to say that's anti-left or whatever. That might have just been anti-me. But I, I agree the general trend is an issue. I just don't think it's like a left is causing the wave thing. Oh, cracker, not honky. Sorry, it was cracker. I get I get all the, the anti-white terms mixed up. Mm. Um, I guess I guess it's done differently on both sides. Like, yeah, you're right that the right does do it more with the legislation. Um, I guess the big tech companies are pretty left leaning so it would make no sense for them to um you know like basically go after like liberal people right because it's like obviously they're left leaning as it is um i mean that's problematic in of itself but that's getting into like a completely different issue um okay well let's go back let's go back to the jordan peterson thing um i've okay, got till the end of the hour by the way in terms okay, of uh, cool. time frame how much longer do you have like 20 minutes uh yeah just over 20. Okay, cool. Um, okay, let's let's let's, uh, let's do the Jordan Peterson thing, and maybe we can take like a few questions because I think uh, we basically covered all the dating topics. I really team. enjoyed the convo, by the way. Yeah, me too, dude. Uh, it's interesting because we really don't disagree on nearly as much as I thought we would. I think it's. Uh, I think this would be one of those rare examples of uh, uh, you know actual civil discourse, <laughs> which I get to have so infrequently. I, I appreciate, yeah. it. but anyway, yeah, hit me up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's hard, man. I mean, like, yeah, I have I, I'm pretty chill with all my debates and whatnot. I haven't had like any two confrontations. The only one that I had was with the Ask Nelly chicken because she just kept getting pissy at me. Uh, but anyway, so onto the Jordan Peterson thing. So when you say he enables fascism again, like in what way does he do that? Like, you, uh, did you think his rhetoric encourages it or like what exactly? Yeah, it's it's mainly that um, cultural Marxism thing. Because if you think Western civilization is being rotted away from within by an elite group of academics who are promoting anti-West and anti-white ideology, there are two things that follow from that. First, democracy isn't going to save you. And second, academia isn't going to save you. Which means you need an anti-democratic and anti-intellectual political movement to seize power and maintain the strength of Western civilization. And in practice, this is almost always going to be a fascist sentiment. Um, and, you know, there are legitimate concerns, I think, that JP could point out, but I feel like the framework through which he's addressing these problems is one which naturally begets like a, like a kind of, a kind of a fascist, um, response. Mm, I would argue that's a pretty, like, um, 
out there logical jump. Like for example, uh, to give an analogy, like going back to what we were talking about earlier about how, um, you know, like, uh, you know, with hypergamy and women dating up, uh, it would be a very extreme logical jump that for someone to say, well, because we're discussing that women date up, uh, that we want laws to restrict women from doing that. And we want to make laws that force women to marry within their whatever fucking social market value. Like that, we don't want that clearly. Right. So I feel like, you know, my thoughts when I see like Jordan Pierce talk about that stuff, isn't so much that we need to go like really far in the other direction and enable fascism, but that maybe we just need to reform these academic institutions. Uh, maybe we need more free speech. Maybe we need to challenge our ideas a little bit more. Uh, you know, not that we need like fascism or like some strong, strong man to like come in and save us. No, I get that. It's just that it is ripped point for point from the cultural Bolshevism thing, which was the big Nazi talking point. Of course, they thought the elite academics were Jews. You know, they just said Jews, but in terms of the role they said the Jews played, it's basically exactly the same. You had left-leaning academic intellectuals who would pervert the sciences in order to get people to, you know, heed degenerate and anti-civilizational prospects. And of course, we know how Nazi Germany ended up. You know, they sure. they went at least a little bit fascist. Um, I, I think it's possible to take a look at what he says and arrive at more moderate conclusions, but I don't think academia needs reforming in the way he's describing. I think that his views on academia are, um, are, are just conspiratorial. I don't think there's an anti-West bias. I think there's a bias towards introspection, which we confuse with anti-West bias because we're so used to the jingoism of, you know, of American exceptionalism that when you start hearing people say like, hey, you know, this country's actually kind of fucked up in a lot of ways. Like, it, it seems like it's an attack, but I think it makes us stronger. Mm. I mean, I, I, would, I would argue there are some legit issues in academia that have popped up in the last five, 10 years. Like, for example, one that I see as highly problematic is this idea of some colleges uh, actually having, like, black-only uh, dorm rooms, right? Like, segregation, which is, like, up until very recently, that was, like, a very, like, you know, like, not progressive idea. That was, like, a very backwards idea, but then somehow it's become, like, progressive. Like, oh, let's actually, let's let's try segregation again. Didn't really work the first time, but maybe it'll work the second time. Like, I think that there's a tendency in academia, especially sometimes, to go so far in one direction with the pursuit of social justice that you wind up actually going in the other direction and doing something as counterintuitive as actually like fucking like having segregation living policies, which is just so dumb and that's beyond me. I won't defend that. Um, a lot of that historically back university black only dorms, they go back like a really long time. A lot of their origins are because their initial dorm segregation was well, I mean, you know, it wasn't self-segregation. It was just regular segregation. Um, but in their in, in how they manifest today, though, like, yeah, I, I agree. It's pretty weird. You know, I can understand the, to, you know, like the racists to like live together and like get to know each other and like be friends. And, like, yeah, no, no, I no, I, I completely agree. Yeah. I'm not in favor of the only thing that I'm OK with is a lot of college campuses will have queer dorms now. I don't even think you have to be gay to be there. I think you just have to be OK with like rainbows plastered everywhere because, oh, my fucking God, do they do that? Um, in terms of like the like this race, that race dorm, I, I agree it's largely counterproductive. I, I disagree with it. In terms of the academic production of 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 you know these these universities, though, I think I think for the most part it's fine. You know, academia is supposed to be contentious. It's supposed to be controversial. It incites discourse. And I'm 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 happy that discourse exists, even if sometimes some elements of the discourse get kind of weird. Yeah, no, I think there definitely should be discourse. I think discourse is a good thing. I think uh, the discourse becomes problematic, though, um, when one side is being silenced. Uh, that's one. And again, like I'm generally speaking, like if you look at like my political leanings, I'm probably much more on the left than I am on the right. Like in terms of like the big issues like, you know, environment, uh, taxation, legalization of drugs and whatnot. Uh, but I'm certainly not in favor of like silencing anybody. Uh, but when you have an environment, where I think not, I don't think most colleges are guilty of this, but some colleges where people are being silenced, like that becomes like problematic in my opinion. No, I, yeah, it, it, depending on how it's done. You know, I'm sensitive to this, especially historically, because back in the 1950s during the McCarthyist era, the group most frequently censored were, were leftists, right? You know, we were fighting the Soviet Union, so communist professors were getting axed left and right. And I, I fully support the free participation in discourse. Um, oftentimes, the, the, the issue I have is that there's this mix-up where a person will be kicked from academia because they suck, but then they'll say it's because they're being silenced. 
Um, to an extent, Jordan Peterson did this as well. And this is not meant to be an attack on him. I think this is fairly uncontroversial. He's not famous for his academia. He's famous for his self-help and political advocacy. The yeah. academic stuff he did for decades pretty quietly before the whole thing. No. Yeah, yeah. No. So he left academia just a couple of months ago. And he talked about how the university was inhospitable and how, you know, the, he was being silenced and the college wouldn't let him do anything. And I don't believe him. He was a huge draw for University of Toronto. I think he left because he makes way, way, way more money and gets way more of his political goals achieved being an advocate publicly than he could by teaching a classroom of 30 people and dealing with their classwork. Like, I think he just left because he wanted to, but he treats it like it's him being excised from academia. And that frustrates me because it's like, you know, how, like, yeah, you know? I don't have enough info to dispute that. You might be right on that. I mean, logically, it would kind of make sense. Like, you'd feel like he's just outgrown that. Like, he's just so much more popular. Like, he's just one of the most, like, frankly, one of the most popular people, like, in terms yeah. of, like, YouTube and whatnot. So it would make logical sense for him to just, like, not want to, you know, teach a class of 30 people anymore unless he's, like, super passionate about teaching, which, you know, I don't think he is that much. Uh, at least I never got that vibe from him. Um, I guess like this kind of goes into one of my pet peeves with like the hard left, I guess, or whatever, the far leaning left is a tendency to throw out uh, labels inappropriately, I guess. Like and this is maybe it's because I'm sensitive to because it's happened to me so many times. But like on TikTok, like all the time, I get accused of pedophile, rapist, uh, woman beater. And like there's like zero evidence of any of that stuff. Like I've never obviously done any of that. You know, I find all that stuff like disgusting. But it's like, what, like I'll always like go down this line of question. I'll be like, okay, well, why do you think I'm a uh, rapist, right? Oh, because you have this video where you say you should double text your girl. I'm like, okay, that maybe means I double text your girl, not that I want to rape a girl. So like, but it's always like, you know, like this labels are just like thrown around so easily. So I guess like, I don't know, that's something that I would just like say, like maybe be a little bit more weary of like going forward, just like, like, cause the label of fascism has like a very, very negative uh, implication. Obviously it's like- so. And to some people, you know, some like it. I and I I do agree. It's it's something I've tried to wheel back a little bit. I do I stick by the enables fascism thing, but I do think there's a meaningful difference between being one and enabling one. You know, technically Nietzsche enabled Nazi Germany because they misinter his sister mis like reprinted yeah. his work and they misinterpreted the Ubermensch thing. But Nietzsche yeah. was not a Nazi actually, uh, not even yeah. close. Um, yeah, you can make the argument about like Karl Marx enabled like Stalin or whatever. You can make that argument about like a whole bunch of things, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I agree with stuff like that. It's happening yeah. all over these days. I mean, like right now, elementary school teachers are getting called groomers for saying that like men can marry men, you know, the whole Republican yeah, Party. Yeah, is. yeah, yeah it's, it's, no, I, I'm telling you, I agree. It's like the politicization thing. Like we're not even having conversations anymore, right? It's just, just insane partisan bickering all over the place. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, we're really not disagreeing on much. I guess. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Is there anything you want to bring up? I, I well, I I mostly want to watch the debate you had with that one feminist that you referred to. Um, oh, Ash Nelly. Yeah, that was. Ash, how is that spelled? Is Ash or Ass? Ask like ask. Ask Nelly. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, yeah. No, I guess no. I, I I think this is a pretty reasonable take. I think that dating is is really really difficult for men, um, yeah. in ways unique to how women like women deal with their own stuff for the most part you know i think men have a very unique set of issues and it's frustrating because men who express frustration at the unfairness and the rigidity of the social roles they have mm -hmm. to overcome get maligned like re like they get a really rough treatment in a lot of yeah, ways and they get shamed. yeah yeah which sucks because women no. in a lot of ways women won't in a lot of spaces if a woman is like i think it's bullshit that i should have to deal with this and men will do this and blah blah, blah like not to say they won't face any criticism, but a decent number of people will agree. But if guys are like, yeah, I think it's bullshit that women like play this game with me and I think it's bullshit that I'm expected to pay, like people will not always respond very well at all. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah dude, there, there's so much irony in the, like what I've realized in the last year or so, like dealing with these spaces. Like, for example, I'll give you a pretty funny example. Uh, on the, uh, you know, on the hard left end of the spectrum, on the feminist side, you have women saying, oh, we women have it hard. Men have it so easy, so easy being a man, so hard being a woman. And honestly, we women, we don't even need men. Uh, and then all the way on the other side, you have, it's so easy being a woman. It's so hard being a man. W women, it's so easy. If only I was a woman, everything would be so easy. And honestly, we men, we don't even need women. And then 
literally if you take all these sides on the opposite extremes who never ever run into each other talk to each other because they don't even know the other side exists they actually want the same thing it's so funny it, it it's, just no, becomes- it's, it's like the the cursed union of MGTOW guys and political lesbian types from the 1960s whether you had all these heterosexual women being like you know we we're, we're not going to enable the patriarchy by popping pussy anymore we're, we're going off to our all female sexless communes you know and it's 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 beautiful if only they could meet you know what a what a, what a joyous union they would have yeah uh, they never they never will and they, they hate talking to each other and if they do ever interact it's super contentious and they start like yelling at each other and shit i've seen like some of those debates it just becomes cringe it's just like people talking over each other which they i never each other that's <laughs> they, you know it's it, they it, hate it, each other but they also love happy. each other yeah basically yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I agree with your point. Like, it always kind of was like a pet peeve of mine when people like say, well, like when any time a man brings up any issue he has, and he's not necessarily saying that we need to have like some legislation or some laws to fix it. He's just like bringing up like a thing that's frustrating for him and he just gets like shamed. Oh, well, you're a man. You should be lucky. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's some advantages to being a man, but there's also some difficulties. Um, so yeah, I'm no, always trying no, to push yeah, back. No, I completely that. agree. And a lot of these guys end up falling into really, really bad movements like the incel like some no. of the incel communities are like suicide cults, basically. You know? Yeah, and they fall into no. that. And I, yeah, I, no. I, I think that's really, really, really sad. So and, and the more this gets discussed in like a reasonable way, the um, the less likely that is to happen. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. The problem is, I've had. I don't know if you've seen like the old debates I've done with like the incels and the black pillars. I think I've done probably more than anyone I know personally. Uh, and it's it's such a frustrating conversation. I mean, you'll just have to watch those debates for yourself, but it, it, it always ends in the same way uh, with them saying, well, you just don't understand because yeah. you have a, because you have your pickup status fame and you have a, like, uh, you're, you have a, I don't know, I don't have a good head of hair. You, you're, you have a good face line. You have a, uh, they, they all use all these weird terms that I can't remember. Um, oh, your, your biennial tilt or some shit. Yeah, you just don't understand the struggle um or whatever or the other assumption is well actually you're actually fairly ugly alex so you must be lying about everything you don't actually have a girlfriend or if you do have a girlfriend you're paying her you're paying her tens of thousands of dollars actually there was some of that in the chat earlier you're you're paying her money to be with you because you're too ugly to get a girl like that it's always like just like really cringe sentiments and like they just never like take you at your word i'm like dude like i used to suck with girls i don't anymore like i do have a cool girlfriend like it's doable uh nah you must be lying or uh, can I, because because I have to dip soon. Can I can yeah. I draw a funny parallel here? Yeah, go for it, man. Okay, this is I'm I'm stepping way outside of my allowed zone here, but there's uh, the LGBT um, subsection of 4chan is famously overrun with depressed trans girls. Uh, they basically run that whole area, uh-huh. and what's interesting is that the 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 logic and the language used there is basically identical to the logic and the language used uh, in incel communities to the point where you'll have perfectly attractive trans women. You know, I mean, even co- even conventionally attractive, you know, like broadly, uh, you know, being told by everyone else there that they should just kill themselves because it's worthless and they'll never be, you know, they'll, they'll never look good or whatever. And you have, and what you described right there, like that you can't reason through to them, um, it's a whole other thing where you'll have like, um, there's always something like you know i'll never be able to overcome this one eighth of an inch of skin on this part of my body or some bullshit like that and i think the the reminder there like the experience of incels um or of people who are feeling depressive in that way i think it's genuinely universal um it's genuinely something everyone can fall into and it's really just which social systems kind of guide you into them and I think that universality should be a sign of hope because it means that no one is truly uniquely fucked. Lots of people have been in that vote. And I think it's I think it's possible to climb out. Like pretty much always. Like, you know? Uh I, I was fine in high school. I was like a fat, acne ridden loser in high school. And I did you know, I did okay. Um it, a lot of it really is just about being kind of good spirited about it, you know? Uh, yeah, not being a victim and not taking, uh, not becoming extremely pessimistic. I think that's the biggest thing. I think once you once you adopt a victim mindset, it's really really hard. I've seen dudes who adopt a victim mindset because then you start seeing everything as against you, and uh, anyone who gives you advice that's different is attacking your identity because you're a victim and he doesn't understand how much of a victim you are. Uh, so that's I think that's the biggest trap people can fall into. Start seeing themselves as victim. 
uh, on both sides, on the, you know, the Mugtel or incel side or on like the hard feminist side. It's like, oh, men are out to get me. Like, uh, you know, like that's also a problematic mindset. No, I, I agree. I think that we should be ruthlessly critical of failing social institutions, you know, but I think that as individuals, we should always be um, sort of stupidly optimistic about our ability to fix our own problems, you know, like socially, you can blame anything and everything, but individually, you should always try your best. And there's no excuse not to really. I, I agree with that. Yeah, 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 I agree with that. Yeah, man, I think this is a really good discussion. I think we should do another one at some point in the future again. But uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting. We really didn't disagree as much as we thought. Of, but maybe in the future, you know, people, I'm sure a lot of people in the comments will be like, oh, what about this one thing? So I'm sure we'll have plenty more ideas for next time on things I'm that we actually do disagree on. Sure they will. And, you know, it's 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 fun to have a nice convo now and again as well. I really do appreciate you having me on. Um, yeah, dude. It was a pleasure. And You uh, really don't have that many, like, nice convos. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I certainly, yeah, no, I certainly don't. I, I don't. Yeah, it's, it's very really? rare. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're, uh, well, can you, since I, I guess we're at the end now, I, I guess we'll shout ourselves out. So could you go and then I'll? Sorry, can I what? Oh, shout ourselves out for the, the oh, five yeah, people. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Alex. I run a business called Playing With Fire. We make practical, no bullshit dating advice. Um, yeah, that's basically me. What about you? Uh, and I'm Vosh, and I, I just talk about stuff. I, uh, I really appreciate the convo. I hope you have a wonderful day. You have a beautiful yeah, dog, by cool. the way. Yeah, man, for sure. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, he's the best. Cool, man. Good chatting. Nice to meet you. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. I actually really, really like that convo. I, I think he's a cool guy, okay? Obviously, some of the language that he used is like language seeped with pickup culture terminology, if that makes sense. So, like, he would say stuff that I agreed with, but the, 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 you know, the the language. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I, I actually really enjoyed that conversation. Yeah, I thought it would go worse than it did as well. I think he's a cool dude. Um, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think what other points I, I would hit on. No, I just really like that, you know? Convos like this make me feel like I'm not totally lost in the sauce. That I can, like, just talk with someone. <laughs> just, like, normally, you know? Not like some other like activist or whatever, but just like I don't even I don't even know if I'd say he's a normie, but just like a person who's not steeped in like the cultural biases of of the political left, you know. Um, it was fine. I would have liked more pushback. the The thing is, like that convo didn't feel like a debate to me. It felt like a well, just like that, a conversation. If we were having a debate, it would be like here's the point, and then he'd say something I disagree with, and I'd be like. Okay, you know, and I've got like my giant, you know, I, I like running through the counterpoints or whatever, but I felt like that was a conversation. And for that reason, it's like, oh, I don't really feel that way because of this, you know, like, oh, well, we'll have to see. I'm okay with taking that lighter tone, mostly because in my experience, when you like try hard the talking points, it, it, it makes people more resistant to what you have to say because it sounds to that like from from to their perspective, you know it sounds like you're just reciting this like concrete list of talking points rather than just chatting with them like normal and friendly. Um, oh yeah, he genuinely seemed curious about the queer perspective stuff. I actually kind of wanted to talk about that more because I found it really heartening. I don't know, like not to sound gay or whatever, it's just kind of heartening. He seemed to like kind of care. Yeah, I don't know. It was, it was nice. Um, obviously, like I'm one of the straighter gays because all the gays that I fuck are like mega femme bot not all the guys that fucked are feminine but like you know the they're 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 all bottoms so i get to basically i get to do the same thing either way okay the real gays are like switches like like guy like guys who are switches and like they can alternate between like one of the 87 divine forms of fucking you know whereas it whereas in my case you know in, in my case you know i, I wander over to the tinder date i check my watch I look at the person and I'm like, yeah, I can do this. And then the same thing happens every time. We go hard. We go deep. Um, we're good. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> Fuck. I don't know, Vosh, you seem super gay. I will definitely say that my mannerisms have gotten a lot more queer-coded over the past few years. That's pretty undeniable. If you go back, like, two years and look at older videos, it's, yeah, pretty clear there's been a change.